Welcome to this week's edition of the Casual Shooters Podcast, your premier podcast for the casual shooter. Our guest today is like none other. He's an optical physicist and, like Mike Shadilov, grew up in the Soviet Union. We are about to find out how smart or how dumb we are as it pertains to optics. Join me in welcoming Ilya Koshkin, the Dark Lord of Optics. Good morning, Ilya. Thank you for having me. I, uh, give you my 100% fully heartfelt promise some point during this thing i'm gonna piss you off okay all right i'm gonna hold you to it then absolutely <laughs> i take it that's a rock solid guarantee well i mean i promise it every time and i haven't been called on it yet so okay all right so Ilya, what i like to do well first actually if you would just take a moment and introduce yourself all right my name is Ilya. i go by dark lord of optics i did not come up with this all right i'm not that i'm vain i'm not that vain uh, somebody else called me that i thought it was so hilarious i adopted it i'm probably going to trademark it um i'm an optical physicist by education in my day job i work primarily with the military related systems uh, mostly imaging and targeting stuff things that sit on planes satellites uh, drones uh, that kind of stuff and for fun i shoot guns a couple of decades ago, I bought a rifle, bought a scope, the scope part. I decided to look into it. Well, you know, 25 years later, here we are. Here, you're still down the rabbit hole 25 years later. No, no, no. I'm fine. Everybody else has done the rabbit hole. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, it's Ilya, not what it's I like... not that complicated. It's just weird. <laughs> okay. What I like to do to start off is just ask a few random ice-breaking questions right off the beginning. So we kind of use them as an icebreaker and get to know you a little bit. All right. Um, Now, for everybody listening or watching, this is the first time I've sent the guest all of the questions. Um, Ilya is a little different. There's a whole bunch of stuff I had on optics. So he knows some of the questions coming ahead of time. Um, So number one, Ilya, what's your favorite movie? Movie? Lord of the Rings. Okay. And why is that? What What is it about Lord of the Rings? I'm a huge sci-fi uh, fantasy buff. Uh, but Lord of the Rings is interesting in that... Um, and when you ask me about the favorite book, that's also Lord of the Rings. It's brilliantly written, and to a significant degree, I learned English uh, off of that book. Mm. When I was growing up in the Soviet Union, uh, of the trilogy of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, only the first one was translated into Russian. I loved it. Uh, second and third were not translated, so I got a hold of them and uh, read them in English. Uh, the guy who wrote Lord of the Rings was a professor of philology and English language and a few other things at uh, in Oxford. He was one of the primary authors of the Tentom Dictionary of English Language. So as far as the beauty of English language, I think Lord of the Rings is way up there and it changed the way I think of language, the way I write, the way I formulate uh, thoughts. Aside from that, I was a teenage boy, and it's a huge quest story. Why would I not like that? Yeah, it seems like all the young teenage kids like Lord of the Rings. The guys do anyway. The guys do, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it is your favorite book, too. Now, so I'm going to ask you a question then. Sure. I've seen some of the movies, not all of them, but how well do they match the book? Uh, better than movies typically match the book. It's pretty good. Okay. Uh, they've made some changes. They had to make a few things to make it more palatable to the uh, politically correct world we live in. Edit some more stuff to make it more graphic for visual consumption, which I thought I thought was not really necessary. They dumped it down a little bit, but not too much. Usually, book adaptations are almost always worse than books. Um, one arguable exception to that is probably Game of Thrones because the books are a steaming pile of shit, but the series is pretty good. (laughs) Oh, this might be the greatest podcast in the history of podcasts right here. (laughs) (laughs) Look, I mean, I I told you, I I have a degree in applied physics from Caltech. I take nerdiness to the next level. Uh, I'm also not getting younger. One of the things I learned over the years is that I don't have a filter. I'll never have a filter. It's okay. It, it is okay, and I'm all right with that. All right, so 
You say you're into sci-fi and that type of thing. What the news um, Do you have a favorite superhero or a favorite historical figure? Oh, absolutely figure? not. I okay, how about historical I, figure? That one gets tough um, because it depends on how you like. There are a lot of them I like that I find interesting from various uh, uh, walks of life. While the whole superhero idea, the way it's the way we think of superheroes, right, in comic book inspired things, right. I think those are fairly brain dead. But uh, as far as historical figures, there's a lot to choose from. But the catch is that we don't know that much about them, right? So what people ask me, for example, about American political figures, arguably my favorite might be Calvin Coolidge, right? Because I think he embodied what the president should be as opposed to a printing peacock race we've got going on now. Calvin Coolidge was an understated guy, did his job, tried to make the government smaller, and his job was... He saw his job as making the government as small as it could be while still doing things. Right? So as far as historical, historical figures go, I lean toward the ideas. People. But the ideas people are often not the ones with big flash ideas. But the ones with very understated ones. Does this make sense? Yeah, a little bit. Oh, um, it's it's interesting you said Calvin Coolidge because history doesn't look on him favorably as a U.S. president. That's because he was not flashy. If you did, I agree a little bit. He was an incredibly spectacular, admirable guy with a very very tragic story. But I don't know Calvin Calvin Coolidge as a person. And I never will. He may have been the world's biggest asshole. He's a politician. I sort of assume they're all asshole. Right? Right. Until proven up. I look at his record and how he behaved himself, how he conducted himself as a president. Right? It's one of the things that I like, you know, the idea of, have you, how far did you get with Lord of the Rings movies? Um, just the first one. Just the first one. Okay. If you ever find the courage. To go to go further, there is an idea for one of the uh, for one of the kingdoms. There, they they lost their king, and now they have a steward. And the steward has been ruling for uh, several generations, right? And the steward of the kingdom, one of his downfalls is he begins to think he's a king. There is an interesting parallel here to the American presidency. The president is not a king. The president can be really thought of as a steward, not a servant so much, but as a steward of the power structures we have here, if you make too much out of them, all hell breaks loose in the history of the 20th century is roughly that. Right. Calvin Coolidge was the opposite of that. He was a true steward of the power structures and strove, it seems, to use them as little as humanly possible unless he absolutely had. To. I'm going to have to go back and, uh, and look at Calvin Coolidge now because I haven't really... Uh delved into him so i'm gonna have to look but, at that but aside from that if you look at different historical historical figures so i'm i'm a child of the 20th century and the 20th century is arguably uh, what i know better than others and if you look at there are several so such interesting characters like winston churchill for example who is big flashy and very much an ideas guy and i there's a lot to like about churchill but he was a man of his time churchill's show was really Special during World War II and during peacetime, he was just another corrupt politician, right? <laughs> yep. Uh, so I try to stay away from admiration of people who you can call a man of his time, right? But Calvin Coolidge, if you look at his record, he was not a man of a particular time. He was a man of an idea. And I like ideas. America is mm. an idea. I remember I didn't grow up here, so I get to appreciate this place a little bit differently than you guys do. But America fundamentally is an idea. You could build it on almost any continent if you had those same ideas. The ideas that came out of Scottish Enlightenment and they were put on paper by a bunch of old white guys, right? Some of them slave owners. <laughs> Tragic, I know. Yeah. But what they put together was an idea. They barely had the place. They barely had the spot. They didn't have a territorial plan. They didn't have a plan for exercise of power. They had an idea, right? And that idea is transcendent. The idea still continues, and hopefully it always does. 
I'll drink to that. <laughs> All right. Now, normally, I, I I'll try to save some uh, something like this normally for the end, but I'm I'm going to ask it up front. Of course. Your favorite optic of all time? Tangent Theater 3 to 15 by 50, the Marksman model with a 30 millimeter tube. Okay. All right. 50. Okay. We'll come back to that then. We'll get into that more a little bit later then. Absolutely. Now, as you had seen, I had read your um, the email you sent out to everybody with your 4th of July message. Mm -hmm. Um what what made you decide to immigrate to the United States or your family, however it happened? Well, a family. We came here as refugees. Uh, when the Soviet Union was collapsing, uh, Soviet Jews had a chance to bolt. It's not a simple immigration process. When I left, it was still Soviet Union. Um, Russia is generally kind of a shitty place and an especially shitty place for the Jews. Um, and during the Soviet Union, it's not like you could pick up and leave, right? The borders of uh, uh, Marxist, Marxist states are usually right. not there to keep people out. Uh, they're there keep to keep people, people in. in. Exactly. Correct. Well, in some ways. Same with East Germany. Correct. You know, that yeah. Makes it all the Marxist countries, right? So sort of the largest open air concentration camp. So when we had an opportunity, we left. There was, you know, people don't quite realize this, but several million Soviet Jews bolted the moment there was an opportunity. About mm. what, between five and 800,000 came to the United States, a couple of million went to Israel, and quite a few interspersed all over Europe, Canada, Australia. There are still some Jews left in Russia, but compared to what it was, it's a very, very small number. Well, and I, I don't know how well people know their history, but I mean, more Jews died in Russia than... At the hands of Adolf Hitler, so well, I don't know. That one is hard to count because it's hard to okay. say for sure. Stalin is responsible for the deaths of more people than Hitler, right? If you look at the general purpose uh, bloodbath of the 20th century, uh, Hitler is broadly responsible for the death of about about 40 million people. Ballpark. Um, Stalin somewhere between 60 and 80 million, and Mao Zedong in China. Uh, probably 80, between 80 and 120 million. It's very hard to keep statistics in China. And now, you can make a fairly solid argument that Mao Zedong was a more prolific killer simply because he had more people to work with. There's a lot of people in China, right? Hitler had to go find them in other countries to kill them. Mao Zedong didn't have to go very far. But uh, Stalin is somewhere in between, right? And if you look at the political ideology of all three people, they are strikingly similar hitler was a little bit more open about racism but the rest of it all three movements are fundamentally uh, marxist movements right fascism came out of european socialism originally introduced some changes brought a few more things into it but they're fundamentally marxist movements and they always end up in a, a bloodbath of some sort stalin uh, right before he died he had a plan to finish off soviet jews there was a somewhat famous case where they planned to accuse a bunch of Jewish doctors of poisoning, of trying to poison Stalin. And they started the case, they started some trials. Uh, my grandmother uh, lost her career, she was a doctor, lost her career for that. They already had the train wow. set up to round up Soviet Jews and ship them off to the area in the Far East, near the border of Russia and China, somewhere just east of Central Asia, uh, and uh, re repopulate all the Jews uh, there. Right, and roughly, you know, one of the more unpleasant places in the world. Cold and and what they were planning yeah. to do afterwards, no. But the, the trains already existed. Um, they were Stalin was planning to repeat the Chechen experiment. In the thirties, he put a bunch of Chechens on the trains and shipped them off to Siberia. He was planning to do the same to, the same thing to the Jews, but then he died, so it didn't come through. Crazy. I need to get you and Mike on here, and we'll have just a Russian slash Soviet Union history yeah. class. Tell, educate the rest of us. Holy it can cow. get interesting. There's a lot of uh, Soviet history that people who grow up in a democracy, no matter how malfunctioning you think a democracy is, if you grow up in a democracy, you don't quite have the feel for what Soviet Union was. And it's an important lesson to learn. I agree. Yeah, I feel like we have some people in this country right now that would think that 
the idea of Soviet communism is good. It just wasn't implemented correctly. You know, if you crazy people. Try it in Russia doesn't work. Try it in China doesn't work. Try it in North Korea, Cuba, Venezuela, East Germany, Cambodia, etc. Every time it ends up being a bloodbath. At some point, you kind of have to admit the idea doesn't work. Yeah, at some point. Yeah. Uh, but I think we have about 50% of the United States uh, inhabitants that don't get it. Uh, anyway. Probably more than 50, but yeah. Yeah, unfortunately. Yep. All right, so I brought you on so we could talk. Um, I heard you first on the um, Philip Vallejo, Kalen Wojcik okay. yeah, the modern day podcast. Sniper. Yeah, exactly. So, and I had them on, um, and I had listened to your episode, and I was like, at some point, when I do a little bit more research on some things, and I, I can come up with more information, I'll, I'll reach out and see if I can get you on. And the, where I wanted to start was the eye's perception of light. Now, I have like a, um, and the reason I'm asking is, you had mentioned something, and now I can't remember what it was, but you had mentioned something about eyes perceiving light and it made me start thinking of things like i have a red green color mm -hmm. defect where when you show me those little discs with all the dots that create a number in there mm -hmm. i i don't see the number but yet when i went in for testing they gave me 30 cubes and on there they had different shades of a color and i had to put them in order from lightest to darkest I got all 30 of them correct. Mm -hmm. So what in the world, or if you can even explain what what is going on there and that type of perception of light, if that's even possible? Uh, there's no real good explanation. I can talk about it a little bit, but um, there's no real good okay. explanation because uh, when we think of vision, we always think of eyes, and that is an insufficient concept, if you wish. Mm. Okay. Uh, the human visual cortex, visual system, is uh, your brain. The eye is the only part of your brain that is outside your body, right? If you look at a human anatomy, the eye can be, at least the retina, the back of the eye, can be viably thought of as the part of the brain that's directly connected to the nerves right there, okay? The optical nerve, We okay. get an eye is essentially kind of like a camera, right? But to get an image out of the camera... Uh, you need a, a processor. The processor is in the brain. That's something called the visual cortex. It's the part of a human brain that is arguably the most complex and arguably the youngest in terms of evolutionary development. You can make mm -hmm. a pretty solid argument that we evolved to a significant degree because of our vision, which is very, very sophisticated, and because of the need to aim. A huge driver of human evolution basically came out of the fact that uh, we needed to grab a rock and throw it accurately right and that's how we ended up being more than just animals you can make a pretty solid argument for that we are fundamentally aiming animals we know how the eye works fairly well you for example your color blindedness and there are different levels of it we have um, color sensitive cells in the back of the eye in the retina okay a retina is essentially a organic equivalent of an image sensor that you have in the regular camera. How is the regular camera built? There is a lens, right? Then there is an image sensor behind it. The image sensor basically what converts optical information to electrical information. And then it goes into the electronic box behind it where the image gets massaged, amplified, corrected. There is also stuff. The raw image that comes straight out of the image sensors. You would like it if you saw it. It needs to look, to make it look good, it needs to be processed significantly. For human vision, that processing is done in the brain. And we haven't the foggiest bloody idea how our brain does it. <laughs> the cause of color blindedness is basically a chemical insufficiency in one of the uh, color sensing cells. So during the day, your uh, eyes primarily use cones, cone shaped cells, right. uh, to see. There are, there are three types roughly red, green, blue. What it means is that this particular cone cell, if it's red, uh, it means it's primarily sensitive to light comes in that's red in color. Color is equivalent to the wavelength. And then there is a blue and a green. There are actually some small number of people that have uh, four types of cone cells. They see a fourth color, 
and then from those four combinations that can see shades of color that you and I can't even imagine. Wow. Okay? But your color I think that's my wife. Uh, women generally do see color better than men do. Yeah, weird. Uh, on average, once again, there are exceptions to everything. Um, but anyhow, so with the cone cells in your eye, since you have some of the red-green color blindness, there is some particular chemical that's either missing or is present in insufficient quantities. Probably the latter, because you're able to see some uh, difference between red and green, just not all of it, if I best I can tell. But then your brain gets that information. And how your brain extracts anything from it? Who the hell knows? He used to work with a guy. He wanted to be a fighter pilot, right? And he, they, they kicked him out because it turns out he was colorblind. He passed through every colorblinded, colorblindness test with flying colors. Because his brain somehow adapted and figured out how different shades intensities, etc., that the brain sees how to interpret them as different colors and only the more extensive tests that the Air Force hmm. were able to catch that he's truly colorblind. Because unless wow. you're going through that, they're not giving you very extensive tests. They're kind of testing you a little bit. There's right. a good chance a lot more people have some level of colorblindness than we know because we don't test for it super rigorously. We test for the real life things to make sure you, know, you can figure out which, which color in a traffic light is which, right? That kind of yeah. stuff. But beyond that, right. we really don't look the at important that. stuff. Yeah, uh, but <laughs> if you're going to be, you know, flying a uh, five hundred million dollar uh, aircraft, well, they test you a little more thoroughly. Okay. Okay. So that's basically it. Unfortunately, there is no real good explanation because this level of color blindness is slightly different in different people, and how our brains adapt to it is different in different people. The most likely thing is that one of the things our brain does spectacularly well is find and recognize patterns. And if you look at different objects in front of you, you will find that we have repeating patterns where you were not used to looking for them, right? But our brain is. We find repeating patterns everywhere. And they're repeating patterns of both structure, meaning uh, intensity modulation, and color. And your brain very likely learned how to recognize certain patterns and assign color to them, and you're imagining it as a color while you're not necessarily seeing it. Wow, it's pretty good adaptation then. Uh, we adapt spectacularly well. No, do you? I don't. Uh, I've never talked to you before. Do you hunt? Uh, I have, but it's been a long time. Okay. So. Have you ever gone out with some super experienced hunter, some older guy? You know, ask him to read something, he's going to go like this. Ask him to read the sign far That's... away, there's no clue. But he can see an elk in the shade behind the mountain from six miles away. And you don't even, you, and you have no idea what he's looking at, right? Yeah. That's adaptation. He's been doing it for so long. His eye has gotten so good at picking out that particular pattern, the shape of an elk, that is otherwise super well concealed that you don't know. And this adaptation happens all the time. Uh, I was uh, three, four years ago, I went on a sheep hunt. That's how I started. I was a shooter, not a hunter, right? And uh, a friend of mine works for Vortex Optics, and they you know, take people out to hunt occasionally, and they had a spare sheep tag not too far from where I live. He goes, hey, calls me up. You want to go? I go, okay, I need the GPS tag, and it'll take me four hours, right? I'm packing. So I went, and we were uh, hunting all that sheep up uh, near El Paso. They blend in with the environment stunningly well. Yeah. So how do you hunt for sheep, right? So there are two small mountains. The sheep are on one mountain. You climb up another one. I'm large and fat climbing up a mountain. It's funny for everyone <laughs> except for me. Um, we set up with the binoculars, and I'm staring at that slope on the mountain. And so is everybody else. And we see nothing. And we see nothing. And then I recognize the sheep. And then the moment I recognize the sheep, my brain starts looking for that shape and i realized that for the past 45 minutes i've been i've been staring at 30 sheep just standing there right in front of me and now you can see them clearly for the it. past 45 minutes i had no idea they were there so some of this adaptation is rapid but a lot of it has learned over the years it, we um i gave you a little bit of my background when when i was teaching that we did um, observation exercises where we took items 
And we, well, we made the students get online at a certain point. They had binoculars and spotting scopes. And then out in front of them, usually anywhere from three yards to 30 or 40, mm -hmm. 50 yards, we'd have items in all different, in the shadows, in different places. And they would, over the course of two months, have a bunch of these exercises where they would start learning what you're talking about, looking for certain things and seeing patterns mm -hmm. and finding things that normal people wouldn't see. Correct. So it, I know it can be taught, but that's very interesting that you you realized you were looking at these sheep the whole time and didn't recognize it. I had no idea. But it wasn't just me. The guide was there near me, and he was really good in fighting sheep, right? Now we had a group that had uh, uh, five people. Two of them are guides, right? Two invited hunters, me and one other guy, uh, the Vortex gentleman who was uh, nice enough to invite me, and uh, there were two guides. They look at freaking sheep all the time, and even they couldn't quite recognize them. <laughs> now, they ultimately saw the sheep before the rest of us did, because they mm. are more trained to it. Right. But it's just... It's just hard. Interesting. I had light transmission in there, but I want—I actually want to wait and save that sure. when we start talking about tube diameter. Okay. So... Um, and, and I'm doing that for a reason based on some things I heard you say in some past podcast episodes. Yeah, if you start talking about light transmission tube diameter, I may need something with alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> I've got some I got some bourbon. Unfortunately, I can't hand it to you, hand it to you through the computer. There you go. <laughs> there we go. But uh, it's uh, you know, it's one in the afternoon, so probably not. Oh, so I want to go inside the scope first, so, right so there. Before, uh, I'll, I'll just point out before we get to the light transmission. <laughs> the question of tube diameter and light transmissions may have been the one question that was where the, what I saw online about it was so blindingly stupid. That's what finally prompted me to get into this. I, and and that and that's why I'm asking you that question because that's because uh, I you know way back in the day. I didn't understand certain things that were going on. So that's in exactly why I put that in here because we need to set the record straight now. I've with been that. doing this once a week for 25 years. <laughs> and it's still people don't get it, huh? Yeah. It just tells you how many people are in this sport and how little attention they pay. And, and there's a lot of information out there that is going to take a very long time to correct. Unfortunately, old wives' tales that appeal to... So before we get into the optics, if you don't mind, I'll do a brief aside. Optics yeah. is, is, as a field at the level at which we talk about it is not difficult. There's a different level, right? Um, that gets more involved. That requires background. Most of the things we're going to talk about today as you ask, ask your questions are not really difficult. They're different. Um, it's a lot of the things related to optics will be counterintuitive to people used to things, mechanical things you can see and touch and perceive in a direct way. Because optics is a little bit different. A lot of things that makes total sense to you, and we'll, we'll get to tube diameter, we'll talk about it, that are absolutely false. But because they because these old wives tales will appeal to your common sense and will appeal to what you normally experience in the world by touch, they're very, very hard to break. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. So uh, that that is one of the reasons I wanted to have you on and talk about some of this stuff. And obviously, I'm going to fall into that same trap with some of it. So, and I'm okay it's, with that. It's um. So when I, uh, you know, you you you're, you joined my online community that I have there. And one of the things I do, mm -hmm. I absolutely refuse to dumb down the message. My basic assumption is that I'm talking to intelligent people who just don't know this stuff. I absolutely refuse to dumb it down and assume that I'm talking to retards. There's only so far I'm, I, I'm willing to go, right? I'm not going to, I'm going to explain it the best I can, but I'm not dumbing it down because it's not that difficult. Okay. And, and I don't disagree with you. Now, where I wanted to start with um, was windage and elevation adjustments. And mm -hmm. this is why I bring it up, Ilya. Back in 90, I'm going to say 92, um, John Unertle 
came to the sniper school and he talked to the students and the staff, we were in there too. Uh, we were asking him questions. And one of the questions I asked was, we had only half MOA fine adjustment. So we had a BDC mm-hmm. on okay. our scope that went from one to 10. One was a hundred, 10 was a thousand. So a hundred yard okay. increments. And then we had it a was half a BDC m- turret, right? Correct. Mm-hmm. And then we had, um, a minute and a half elevation up and down fine tune. So okay. if you put it on seven and you needed to go down a minute, you know, to match up with your bullet, you could. <clears throat> now I asked him, I was like, Mr. Urinal, can we get quarter minute MOA adjustment? Um, and he said, no, at the time they didn't have a way of making that accurate enough. Mm-hmm. So, and I have since found one eighth MOA adjustment. Mm-hmm. So my question to you is how accurate are those different adjustments? The more fine they become. Um, they're still accurate. It just depends on who makes them, right? Um, if you go to Tangent Data, Schmidt and Bender, I don't know, uh, a high quality company and they make a one eighth MOA adjustment. And just as general disclaimer, um, switch to Milrad. But anyhow, aside from that, <laughs> uh, if they make it, it's going to be accurate. So we had, uh, we had uh, back back in the Nurtle days, and also you know, when he said that uh, we could not make them accurate enough, he was giving you half truth. He could not make it accurate enough. Right. It wasn't that hard to make it accurate enough, right? It's absolutely doable. Uh, do you mind if I sketch something? No, go right ahead. Me? Okay. Yeah, go right ahead. For that, I'm going to disconnect my ear, earpiece for a moment. I'm going to do a very, very quick sketch. And okay. then I'm going to reconnect the earpiece and I'll be able to hear it. You'll be able to hear me my microphone is remote. Okay. Okay. Can you see it reasonably well? So it's basically a lens. Yep. Right? It has certain focal length. It focuses the light. Here, this is where the reticle would be. This is the turret that moves the reticle up and down. Okay. Okay. So when you're trying to change it by one eighth MOA, one eighth MOA is an angle, right? You mm-hmm. basically there is so there is, this lens creates a fairly large image here. The reticle is much smaller, and you're moving it within that image. Okay. Right. Right. One eighth MOA is an angle. If you have very short focal length, if this focal length from here to here was half the length, one eighth MOA adjustment would be half of the linear step. The step here would have to be very, very fine. If you make the objective lens distance between the front of the, the objective and the turret box longer, then one eighth MOA step is, is a larger, twice larger linear movement if it's to, if the focal length of the objective is twice longer. Okay. Okay, so making sense. It's like imagine like a fulcrum point and you need to move by a certain angle, right? If you make mm-hmm. a very long lever, you need a comparatively large movement to change the same angle than if the lever was shorter. Right. Okay. So in, in the terms of scope manufacturing, which one's easier, shorter or longer? So longer is easier. Okay. And uh, if you make a longer optical system for the objective, the threads on the turret can be coarser and easier. To okay. Make. Okay. If you're trying to make a very short scope with very, very fine adjustment, it becomes mechanically difficult because you have to do mechanically finer uh, machining. But we're capable of it. And we were capable of a lot of it in the 1990s too. Yeah, and, I, and to now, okay, that makes more sense too because the Unertal was a shorter scope. Correct. It was short and, power scope. Correct. And at the time, that's when the Leopold Mark IV M1s and M3s came out, mm-hmm. which I loved the Mark IV M1. Mm-hmm. So that's why I asked them because those were coming out on the market, and I'm like, man, this thing's amazing. If we could get that turret in the you know the unertal scope we'd be solid yeah unertal was a good scope but it wasn't particularly well weather sealed it had fairly spotty machining but you know it held together and it had a military contract and changing something with the military is not so simple no it is not that's a whole other story correct but uh, to answer your question so one quarter moa one 
one eighth MOA, one half MOA, 0.1 mil region, 0.05 mil region, 0.2 mil region. From a standpoint of manufacturability, all of that is absolutely doable if the company that does it knows what they're doing. Okay. Now, I, I have not seen too many 0 0.05 mil radian scopes out there. Oh, there are quite there. a few. They're not, they're not, not a huge number, but there are a few. In terms okay. of equivalence, right? So when uh, one quarter MOA and 0 0.1 mil red are fairly close, 0 0.1 mil radian is a little bit coarser. And every yeah. once in a while, somebody does some you know, bench rest, that kind of stuff, where finer adjustment is, is a benefit. And there are a few high magnification scopes that uh, want to cross into that, and they do 1.8 MOA or 0 0.05 mil radian turrets. Okay. All right. Now, why are you trying to talk me into going with mills, mill radians and not <laughs> MOA? Uh, most, mostly to make fun of you. Okay, good. So, mill radian, <laughs> make, uh, so as a system, you know, they both work just fine. Mill radian makes a lot more sense if you're trying to do ranging, trying to memorize wind holds, etc. If you shoot your MOA, your whole life stick with it. Um, the important thing is not so much MOA versus mill radian, but to think in terms of angular units, not to try to figure out it's one inch at 100 yards or one inch at 200 yards. If you stay away from linear units, it doesn't matter what you use. Okay. Yeah, I've been doing MOA my whole life, and it, I find it to be faster for me than than no, mill. So. because you're used to it, right? I, I mostly shoot mill rad. Uh, so much so that most of the time I even refuse to review scopes that are MOA only. I'm going to make an exception in a couple of months. But mostly okay. because just for me, switching back and forth is a pain in the ass, but it's not that hard. If I switch, to, if I take an MOA scope and shoot with it for a couple of weeks, I'm fine. Okay. All right. Now, my next question, it's funny because the next thing I wanted to talk about, you also sent out... Um, an email today that you're it, it's the one you said coming soon to a mailbox near uh -huh. you. Yes. So I want to talk about magnification factors. Mm -hmm. And I found it interesting that one of these, um, where did it go? I saw it the March five to 42. That's like an eight and a half magnification factor. Mm -hmm. A little more than eight. Yeah. Yeah, so I want to talk about that and why that matters. I prefer one between a um, a four and a five magnification factor, but this is an eight and a half. So what does all of that mean? Okay, uh, you're going to trigger my OCD. It's 8.2. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, you're right. It is actually 8.2. Well, is it? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, 8.2. I'm using the wrong number. You're correct. Okay. He's going to argue math with me. Great. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm gonna piss you off. <laughs> oh, you're not gonna. You're not gonna. I'm. An, I'm a professional, arrogant jackass. It takes more than that to piss me off. You, you want to hear a funny story about math? Going through school and all that math yeah. was always my weakest subject. What? Yeah. And you. Well, got I, I mean, drawing, like art, that kind of stuff. That was probably the weakest, but it's not the subject. Uh, of the actual subjects, math was my weakest. I became a physicist because in sixth grade, I got a C in physics and I took it really personally. I don't mm. handle failure very well. My strongest okay. subjects were generally history and literature. Wow, literature. Okay. All Go right. Uh, yeah, I love history. I, I love that kind of... I love math. I was very good in math. Um, my, my teacher would actually, as a senior in high school would call on me because she knew I did math differently than her. And she'd mm -hmm. have me come up and do my way on the board for everybody oh, cool. to see. That's so, cool. yeah, it was pretty. The Korean guy who sat behind me to the right would ask me for help. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> look, uh, look, I have a degree in applied physics from Caltech. I didn't say I'm bad at math. I just said it. <laughs> uh, all right. So let's get into magnification factors. Mm -hmm. what, what are we talking and why does it matter? So generally speaking, uh, if you don't mind, I'll plug my article I just wrote for Shooting Illustrated. Yeah. It's exactly on that subject on uh, magnification ratios, also called director ratios. And it's available online. And uh, I actually, I linked it on one of my posts. If you find it, uh, a link, it kind of goes over that. Uh, I've talked and written about that a good bit. Uh, it matters. It's sometimes a good thing, sometimes a bad thing. It's something called the erector ratio. Um, the magic there sits between the front and second focal plane. So basically, the between the turret box and the eyepiece, that's where the uh, erector lenses are, 
when you change your magnification, all those lenses move with respect to each other, and that's how you end up with a magnification change. The more magnification change you have, the harder it is to build a high quality scope. I didn't say it is impossible, but it is hard. It's not so simple. And there are some compromises you make for that. So the overage of a large magnification ratio is flexibility. If you're trying to have one scope that's going to do a lot of things well, a broad uh, magnification range is generally a helpful thing. Definitely a helpful thing, helpful thing on paper. It's certainly a helpful thing if your application requires it. For example, I have a March 1.5 to 15 by 42 with a 10 time magnification ratio. Ooh. Right? It's a nice compact scope. Is it optically as excellent as some of the other, even you know, March scopes? March makes very nice stuff. I don't have the one and a half to 15 here with me. It's another house. Um, never mind. Uh, but you know, I have it. And uh, if I was just choosing a scope for precision shooting, that would not be my choice, right? But as a general purpose design that I want to use for crossover use, for hunting, for some distance, etc., it's wonderful. Why? On low power, I can match it to a thermal clip on where low power, you need low power to match well, right? But it goes high enough where I can shoot out to a good distance. It is mm -hmm. currently sitting on six and a half grand, I've taken it to a thousand yards. But then on one and a half, I can shoot standing in a clear room if I really need to. Is it as good as a red dot? No, but it's better than a 10 power scope would be, right? So flexibility is a real thing. The big question is that do you need it? Most people who go for it don't really need it. And there are compromises involved with it. Uh, one of them is that um, the way you optimize optical systems, you will it will be as optimal as possible at one of the settings, and then it's going to fall off at the other ones. Now, how much of a fall off you're going to see depends on once again on who designed it and who made the scope. Right, the high quality manufacturer will keep it reasonable, but there's always some sort of a fall off. Okay, if you think about it, if you think optimization, optimization is not to make an optical system perfect. Optimization is basically to make it as good as it can be given the design. Okay, think of it as a percentage, right? So. If let's say if you are talking from zero to 100% and you have a scope that's, I don't know, five to 30, if you optimized it on 30 power, it's not gonna be as good as it can be on other magnifications. Right. Is this making sense? Yep. Right, so there are tricks you can do in how you optimize it and all that. You can try to sacrifice one of the magnifications and a lot of high error ratio scopes do that. Uh, but uh, there is going to be some sort of a compromise. In practical terms, one of the most common compromises is the depth of field. It's very, very okay. difficult to make a rifle scope that has good depth of field and is still compact, <clears throat> excuse me, with a high erector ratio. Okay. So that's one of the things. So March scopes that tend to have high erector ratios and by design. They intend to do uh, them that way. Have usually fairly shallow depth of field that makes you work the parallax turret more and things like that. For some disciplines, it's not really a downside. For example, if you are, gosh, if you shoot field target air gun, I don't know if you're an air gunner, uh, field target guys are spectacularly good shots. It's stunning how good those guys are. They use their uh, side focus of their uh, rifle scopes to do range finding. They're shooting mostly at comparatively short distances. They calibrate their side focus to it. And they need that very shallow depth, <clears throat> excuse me, that shallow depth of field because they turn it until the target is in focus and they know that this setting right. of the parallax turret correlates to this distance. If you have very large depth of field, you can't do that. Right. Right. So there, they need very high magnification where you have shallow depth of field anyway. And then at the same magnification, some designs will have greater depth of field and some will have shallower. For practical shooting on plates, you generally want uh, greater depth of field. Okay. Like tangent data scopes, uh, like so much, have very large depth of field. Now, I feel like the more pieces of glass you get in there, so the, the greater the magnification ratio, Mm -hmm. um the more and, and maybe this is where i'm wrong maybe i'm being counterintuitive here but i almost feel like it's going to degrade the clarity because of all the different lenses in there as well as it starts refracting light and then the image becomes darker okay yes no maybe so, yeah both statements are nonsense so okay uh, uh i warned you 
Yeah, I'm okay with that. So I'm going <laughs> to give about a number of pieces of glass. So let's step away from the... You're intuitively, there is some truth to what you said, but you're generally wrong about this one. And it's... Okay. You're wrong because it's not a good way of thinking about it. The way... How many lenses do you think are in a typical rifle scope? Oh, boy. Well, I, I guess it would depend, too, if it's a first focal or a second focal. No, um, that actually makes no difference. Okay. Um, one, two, three, at least four, at least four is what I would say. So, uh, I, I can probably find it or I'll send it to you later. Uh, Hensold, some, made quite a few years ago, nicely put together a diagram of the four to 16 by 56 scope with how many lenses are inside, uh, about 20 years ago. And it's not a new design. It's an older design and it's a four time ratio, right? 4 to 16 by 56. So it was a very, very nice scope, scope in many ways. If I remember correctly, I think there are 17 lenses in there. Just the objective, I think, has eight. Good Lord. Okay. So the way optics work, remember, I'm going to, I thought I'm, I'm going to tell you things that are counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. The way optics work. So you have a lens. And in principle, you think that the lens is just going to focus light. It's all going to be perfect. It's not. We, as of about three years ago, we actually have a way to make a perfect lens. I don't think anybody has managed yet, but we have at least a theoretical way of doing it. But most of the lenses have comparatively simple um, uh, geometries. What is geometry? I mean, lenses work based on the curvatures. There are two sides to them, and they're curved. And in very particular, these curvatures is what define everything. So you make a lens. You look at the image. It looks like shit. It's distorted. Color is all over the place. What do you do? You make a second lens. You design it in a very specific way from a very specific material with very specific geometry. You're going to put it behind the first lens at a particular distance. Okay. Right? And the purpose of the second lens is to clean up some of the crap brought in by the first lens because that lens is not perfect. Neither is the second one. But the second one has corrected some of the aberrations, spherical aberrations, uh, chromatic color aberrations, uh, you name it. You look at the image, it goes, hmm, that's a little better. You go and design a third lens, and that lens is designed not to just focus light. It's designed specifically in light of what's in front of it, the two, the first two lenses that were made. And that third lens is going to correct a few more of the aberrations, etc., etc., etc. Now, each lens you put in there is going to correct some aberrations, and it's going to introduce some new ones that the next lens in the lens train is going to start correcting, etc. So it becomes a really interesting balancing exercise. Uh, the best scopes in the world have a lot of lenses. Okay. Uh, my best, uh, I used to do this example some years ago, uh, Carlos had two hmm. very, very similar hunting scopes. They were both 3 to 9 by 42 scopes, so a very, very nice scope. One was, it was before they renamed everything and all that. Uh, back then, before Carlos had a hit on me. Uh, but uh, uh, one was KX and another one was shit, uh, CL. CL had, I think, side focus. KX did not. What in practical terms it means is that the CL, otherwise, you know, same configuration, had, I think, two extra lenses in it, right in front of the reticle. No, excuse me, right in front of the focal plate front focal plane and what those lenses did they flattened the field a little bit corrected a couple more things so the cl had two more lenses but if you look through it the image looked brighter hmm. why did it look brighter it was not brighter you added two more lens elements to it i think it was two it's been a while so i could be wrong could be three could be one but there was more more lens elements okay uh in principle the actual total amount of light that got through the scope was a little bit less but it was it still looked bright and looked better and if you asked people and i used to do this experiment which one of these do you think has high light transmission every single one of them pointed out to the cl which actually had lower light transmission but it had higher image fidelity it was corrected a little bit better because it had a couple more lens elements put in by smart engineers at Carlos to make the image quality better. And because the image quality was better, color was better, contrast was better, it looked brighter to everyone. Oh, wow. So you're deceiving your eye, really. You're not deceiving In a anything. way. That's how the image looks to you. The way we see things, light intensity does matter nearly as much as we think. Small uh, differences in a total amount of light, we can. Until we get into very low light levels, and we can talk about that, that's a little bit different. During the day, small differences in the amount of light does, don't really 
matter, we can't even see them. But the image quality, a very high quality image will look often look brighter to us. But again, not to everyone, right? But will generally you will see more and your brain will go, oh, it's a much brighter image. Hmm. Okay. Make sense? Yeah, it does. Okay. Interesting. Now, how does so, tube diameter? Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, be, before that, I'm sorry. Let, let, so let's get back to the uh, erector ratio business just, just to close that yeah. up. So oftentimes it does require some additional lenses. And oftentimes this extra complexity will result in an image that may not be as good because you have different requirements. If you took all those lenses with a single purpose of getting the highest possible image, that's one thing. But you're adding more lenses than more complex to get a high magnification ratio. And it can, it doesn't have to, but it can have a detrimental effect on the image quality as well. But it will definitely have a detrimental effect on some of the outside parameters, like I said, depth of field uh, uh, becomes one, image quality edges can be one. It's just a harder system to optimize, especially if you're doing this on a budget. If you see a very, very complicated mm -hmm. design sold for $200, I'd be a little bit leery. If they're selling it for five grand, eh, it's probably gonna work pretty well. Unless it is a counter sniper, then it won't. Were you around for the counter sniper debacle? No, I wasn't. Oh, Jesus. There was a company called Counter Sniper. They had these um, uh, very colorful ads in all the gun magazines, how it was military overrun, super duper, uh, bertrilliums and titium. They were inventing words. It was stunning. So whoever <laughs> did that marketing was just completely shit. If I ever run into that guy, I'm going to break his legs. Like, I, you know, if I have to go to jail, so be it. Um, <laughs> whoever wrote that nonsense, it was so people were paying several thousand dollars for that shit. It was like $200 Chinese scopes with turret upon turret. They would put a mill dot radical in the field of view and an extra mill dot underneath it, you know, just to make it look cool. So, for the <laughs> it was irresistible to the mole ninjas. But the interesting part is that uh, they somehow got Craig Boddington, who was generally a very well-respected gun writer, to write an art a positive article about that stupid thing for some gun magazine. And boy, <laughs> did he get slapped for it. Justifiably so. He deserved it. Okay. Wow. So except for those cases, if you get a $5,000 scope from Schmidt and Bender on Tagent or whatever, and it has a complicated design, yeah, they probably put in the time and effort. Uh, to polish it and make it look good. If it's a 1 to 28 by 6,000 scope from Barska, yeah, I would stay away. Gotcha. <clears throat> and now before we get into first and second focal plane, let, let's go ahead since we're talking about um, light, and since we touched on that a little bit, and the magnification factor, let's talk tube diameter because initially... You know, way back in the day when there was only one and 30 millimeter tube size, the big thing was, oh, you get more light through a 30 millimeter tube. Yeah, now we have 36 millimeter tubes. Yeah. What is the purpose of these tubes continuously growing in size? Uh, so first of all, tube diameter does not correlate to light transmission. That's absolute nonsense. And I don't know how many arguments I've had. I even had a guy make a short video and send it to me. He was a, he took two different water hoses of different diameters. Said, "See, this one pushes more water through than this one." And I basically told her, told them to put the hoses away and never touch a gun because he's too stupid to, to run one. Um, we could be best friends. Oh, fuck's sake. Um, oh, cursing is okay, right? Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. I have um, I have two comparatively young children. So since they're not in earshot right now, some bad language is going to come out, possibly in multiple languages. Not a problem. Uh, <laughs> multiple languages. But um, to make a complicated optical design, you need real estate, basically. Right? Okay. There yeah. you go. That's basically it. Um, the simpler the scope, the smaller of a tube you can get away with. Um, the larger, uh, the more complicated the scope, the more you could use the real estate. Remember, it's the lenses, that's the mechanics that hold them. For example, for high, for how does a regular erector system work, right? So if you have a three or four or five time uh, magnification ratio, it's, erector system is basically two telescoping tubes, right? One inside the other like this, mm -hmm. right? 
if you have a 10 time erector ratio it might be three telescoping tubes I mean, it's space for all that all these uh, all these machined elements machined pieces need to be made with some thickness to them so they you know maintain their structure lenses need to be held uh, some companies can do micro machining very well others can't for example you know there's this romanian company called ior right uh, i happen to not be a huge fan of their products they were the first to go to a 40 millimeter tube and actually they start right oh we'll have the biggest tube right and it's like everything becomes a dick measuring contest or oh, i have a 42 millimeter you know, fill in the blank uh they went to higher diameter because in romania they have pretty decent optical designs they have quality control issues and they don't mm. have a very good ability to machine very small things so they just need space for their machine stuff they can't machine small things consistently they can barely machine large things consistently okay right now if you want the ultimate image quality it's easier to optimize it and tune it if you have more space also if you are trying to have a fairly significant adjustment range and you want to minimize the optical quality roll off as you adjust to the edges of adjustment it's easier yeah. if you have more space is is that why zero compromise has a 36 millimeter tube or it's one of the it's, you know? it's, it's one of the reasons okay uh, you don't have to have right uh, i mean zero this year was a very very good uh, optics company um right they claim they're the best i had a falling out with them because i didn't say that they're the best but they're very very good um, i think tangent ultimately makes slightly better design there's a new tangents coming out now the 7 to 35 that's also 36 millimeter because uh what they did is that uh, when they went to this uh, different optical design they looked at it and decided they can do a little bit more with it if they had a little bit more space so they bumped up the tube size and that is the right way of doing this don't make a tube size for marketing there are a lot of scopes out there that are some large tube size just because people think bigger is better right um make a design think how much space you need make a tube size based on your design requirements okay. and that makes sense yeah so this but you know this all makes reasonable use of that space i wish the field of view was a little bit wider uh but you know they also marketed it as larger is better but look at their scopes i mean they're using that space well so i don't really have an issue with them okay so you see more probably than more of the very higher end scopes than being probably a 36 millimeter tube size for you image know, quality and, and hard to say because once again it just depends on the design right so this year was all 36 millimeters eyes on the hunting scope stuff went to 36 now went back to 34. tangent hmm. was 34 or 30 for example with the tangent theaters 3 to 15 by 50 scope they have two models 30 millimeter tube and 34 millimeter tube um optically they're absolutely identical right 34 mm. millimeter tube is larger heavier and all that and gives you more adjustment range okay. I like the 30 millimeter one because uh, where I use that scope I don't need that much adjustment range and I prefer a lighter scope optically there's no difference but somebody going shooting at a further distance that elevation travel if you need a lot of down would be travel, oftentimes a larger tube scope will give you more elevation assuming the company who made it actually took advantage of it and it wasn't just done for marketing okay so and it's not okay. an easy assumption right so if if this stuff could be easily figured out from just looking for specs uh you know i wouldn't have an audience right, <laughs> right. fundamentally yeah. if you're it's a you know like that's sort of what what do i do in internet so, uh, I like doing education, right? So I like telling people how to look at this stuff. I explain how I make my decisions, how I look at scopes uh, and stuff like that. But I also have the ability to get my hands on a ton of scopes, right? So most people who are ready to drop five, six grand on a scope end up looking for people like me who actually had our hands on them to get some idea. Right. Is it designed well before you drop that much money? Yeah, I'm actually looking forward to that when you do that comparison test with all of those scopes. Uh, that's yeah, going to be very be interesting. interesting. Yeah. I always enjoy this one. I have this uh, uh, fixture that goes in a tripod. I actually have the fixture here. 
that can put uh, on six scopes side by side. I've seen that. Yeah. So w when I do this test, it is going to be the most expensive tripod I've had <laughs> yet. So when I assemble this one, give me one second, it's going to be uh, at least 30K. Yeah, it's about it's going to be about a $35,000 tripod. Oh, goodness gracious. I'm going to a lot, lot of money on a tripod. Yes. I, I'm uh, assuming you're, you're, you're just my computer not charging. Hold on. One, one second. Uh oh. Oh, that's why I plugged in the wrong cable. Well, that's OK. It's plugging in a computer is not math, so it's okay. it's acceptable. Oh, and he's frozen. Well, I hope everybody's enjoying this so far with Ilya. May have to listen to it a couple of times, get used to his accent. All right. You got it? Yep. Uh, you're back. All right. Are you getting used to my accent a little by little? Uh, yeah. And I, while you were frozen, I told people, I was like, I hope everybody's enjoying this and they may need to listen to it. Like, I, I've listened to you enough now that I can pick up on 99% of what you say every now and then you say something. I'm like, what did he say? But I've got your accent almost completely down. It's a funny thing. When I came to America, I never had to take English as a second language class. As I got here just old enough to never lose mm. the accent, but I read and wrote English quite well. And I spoke fairly well. The accent was already so well set. It will never get rid of it. Ultimately, my English is better than my Russian. I speak Russian without an accent, but in terms of the quality of the language, my English is better. Wow. Now I would like to, now that we've talked about tube diameter and that type of stuff and magnification factors, let's talk first focal plane versus second focal plane. It seems like you're a very big proponent of first focal plane. For I most uses, yes. Okay. I'm a bigger proponent for me of second focal plane. But you also shoot them away, so that makes sense. <laughs> Yes, I do. I, did I say I was partially Polish? <laughs> uh, don't start me on the Polish. <laughs> oh goodness! So, and you're a big, or you're a, for most things you prefer first focal plane, and Correct. why is that? Uh, I use the reticle a lot for holes, uh, okay, range, for... estimation, basically. Okay. And if you're using the reticle a lot, um, then the second focal plane is a recipe for disaster, basically. True, because especially the if you don't know what you're the doing. radical change, and because the magnification ring on the way it's engraved on rifle scopes is more of a suggestion than an actual magnification. So unless you take the time to calibrate your rifle scope at specific magnification, you do not know what those radical dimensions are. And then on top of it, and for precision shooting, this is a uh, most significant problem is that uh, every single second focal plane rifle scope, when you change your magnification, your point of aim shifts. Sometimes very little, sometimes a lot on, on crappy scopes. But there is no second focal plane scope in existence where your point of aim does not shift with magnification changes. Mm, by design. Very interesting. And, and front focal plane scope, by design, by definition, because the reticle is superimposed on the image, yeah. Before you start doing all the magnification business, you the image can shift around. And in many scopes, you actually see this. You see that your primary image point is all of a sudden not in the center of the image. It's very slightly off and different if you can move around like this, right? But the way the reticle is superimposed on the image is, stays consistent. If your reticle is in the second mm. focal plane, your image moves the same way. And then sometimes you can see it if you pay attention, sometimes not because it's a small shift. But there's always a shift. So every second focal plane I have, and I have a few, I go and map it out and I figure out what that shift is. And do I need to worry about it or not? And then as I use it, I have to think, about, okay, is, it, is that shift going to get worse with time? Because every time I change magnification, this lens is move, right? Is something wearing in? Am I going to start seeing more lens hop? Mm. Okay. okay. Now, are you do? can you do that without... So what I'm getting at is... Um when I first get my scopes, I like to take them to a hundred yards and turn the um, elevation and windage turrets and see if they map out with a grid system on a target. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I'm doing an eighth of a minute, I've noticed that they don't always exactly match up to an eighth, but overall they do. 
Mm-hmm. So it still gets me close enough in the ballpark. Is right. that how you're finding your point of aim shift? Is Essentially, you can you can lock your scope uh, in a vice, right? Mm-hmm. And look at a particular target. And as you change magnification, you sometimes it's so they calibrate it so well it's very small you don't see anything. Sometimes you can clearly see. Okay. It. There are a couple okay. of dual focal plane rifle scopes now in the market where there is a reticle in the first and second focal plane. And as you change magnification, you can actually see the two reticles move with respect to each other. There, it's very easy to see. That okay. would drive me nuts seeing two different reticles. I... Yeah, it, it's it's not it's actually quite a good way to go for some applications, right? I wouldn't probably wouldn't be my preferred design for precision shooting, but it's not necessarily a bad way to go for uh, other things. My basic problem is that tolerances and errors have a have a tendency to stack up. And with any mechanical device that involves movement, and the rifle scope is not an optical device, it's an optomechanical device. With any mechanical device that involves movements, things where in, change, shift around, etc., I want to minimize the number of things I need to be paying attention to, especially when right. I'm nervous, stressed, tired, whatever. Right. Okay? The downside of front focal plane reticles is that depending on how the reticle is designed, it can look very small on low magnification or very thick and large and high magnification. Yes. Uh, a lot of that can be overcome with reticle design. That's why I design reticles for people. But uh, I prefer to deal with that than to be worried about what may be happening mechanically. I'm basically just trying to cut down on potential mechanical issues. Well, and see, and and I guess I've been thinking counterintuitively again, because I would think that a second focal plane scope would have fewer mechanical parts you would have to worry about. Um, so so obviously number of mechanical parts and same as parts. a first. Okay. Yeah, makes no difference. But the other thing is that I'm more of a precision shooter guy, not a, practical shooting guy when it comes to mm-hmm. rifles mm-hmm. um so i like so explain to me the difference then i so think i know but I... let's let's be clear mm-hmm. with terminology okay so i am not a prs guy who shoots at larger targets i am a, a bullseye shooter who shoots who's aiming for uh, an moa or smaller target at different yeah. ranges so I'm yeah, trying but, to be but extremely no known, known distances, right? Correct. Yeah, if you're shooting known distance and you train, none of this makes a big difference. Uh, and if you use a high quality scope, it doesn't really matter. It has still has a chance of biting your ass. But um, I so the way I shoot, I prefer to use the reticle for wind, and I want the reticle holds to be consistent with all magnifications because I'm outdoors, and depending on the conditions I may be shooting in different magnification. I don't want to be trying to figure out what magnification I'm on. I just adjust and, the magnification for what I'm doing. And that makes perfect, absolute sense. So it obviously depends on the application that you're looking at. But that's also why I like MOA versus mil and eighth MOA adjustment because I want to be able to adjust as close to that exact center as I can and then use my wind reading ability and other things to maintain shots right. versus holding if I can. Correct. I will hold yeah, if need be, different. but yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. So, uh, but um, uh, what part of the country are you in? East Coast. East Coast, okay. Um, I actually don't know. I've never shot in East Coast. I don't know what you guys do with wind. I live up in the mountains in New Mexico. Uh, in a single range session, I can have wind from five to 35 miles an hour and it can change on me while in a heartbeat. I've had wind right. where I'm shooting off a tripod and I go from perfectly still to it's moving my 300 pound ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and I get it. Anytime you start shooting at elevation, you've got other things you've got to deal with. Yeah. So, so, uh, I, so front focal plane, so two things, front focal plane in principle is minimize the number of things that can go wrong. Mm-hmm. That's one. Uh, two, the most important thing, it's about the Indian, not the arrow. If you know what you're doing, you can make either one work just fine. And so I want to, down to. so since we're talking about them, I noticed on March's website, they mm-hmm. actually have a formula that you can use to determine 
the actual size of your reticle at different magnifications. Have you mm -hmm. seen or played with that at all? Mm -hmm. And is it accurate? I haven't looked at it. They okay. generally know what I know what they're doing, but I can look and tell you if they made a mistake or not. Uh, I would not rely on any formula. Okay. For March, maybe they every scope at March makes. So I, I do occasional consulting for March. I'm very friendly with those guys, and I know and I have a bunch of their scopes. So they're very very good. But for the most part, I will absolutely not trust any sort of a formula for actual. Uh, uh, for actual shooting. If you're going to shoot in a particular magnification, you have to go and test it out. I once okay. on the fanciest scopes, Tangents, Schmidt's marches, etc. Uh, was there march in there? Just, I don't know. There was no march in that test. Uh, I do this series of tests called High and Tactical. And um, I uh, mapped out the magnification versus field of view, right? And it should be linear. And not... Uh, and what I did is I mapped out the magnification markings on the magnification ring versus okay. field of view. Not a single one was linear. Oh, wow. Okay. So the, the top end and high end magnification, most of them were accurate. ZCO was not. was another one that was not most of the accurate. Intermediate markings, yeah, pretty much. Might as well, might, might as well swap it out for your shoe size. <laughs> okay. All right. So I don't trust any of that crap, and I have yet to be wrong about this. If you're using second focal length scope, you better you better map it out. It might be dead on, it might be close, it might be way off. Hmm. Okay. So obviously it's going to vary by manufacturer too. Then. By manufacturer, there's going to be sample variation. You have to map out your specific scope. Right. Okay. Now, with that, we've we you spoke briefly about depth of field, which mm -hmm. I used to do some photography stuff. So it's the same same thing that you're talking about. Correct. Now, for non extended, um, long range shooting, I feel so. Like I, as I put in my email to you, I've done mm -hmm. some NRA out to a thousand yard matches. And I found once I get over 20, from 20 on, I have found that, and maybe it's just the scopes I've been using, that I end up magnifying environmental um, conditions like mirage and such, mm -hmm. sometimes more than the image quality degrades and I'm getting more environmental conditions when I magnify I back it off a little bit and I have better clarity of my target. Um, okay. Do you see this across the board or it, does it really depend on the better the scope, the less you see of the environmental conditions? Uh, the... So, so a little bit of both. Um, if you're using a very high quality scope, uh, when you go up to high magnification, image quality doesn't really degrade. The image you see degrades, right? Image quality really means that the scope is taking in a particular image and magnifies it and transmits it out to your eye. If it's taking in a miragey, wavy, low-quality image and transfers the same thing to your eye, image quality did not degrade. I right? gotcha. Okay. Right. So that's once again just somewhat different way of uh, of thinking about it. Okay. If you have crap atmospheric conditions, you have crap atmospheric conditions. Um, I often shoot with fairly high magnification scopes, but I don't shoot them on high magnification very much. Always keep in mind, so I'm not as, as good a shot as you are to start with, so I have to shoot within my limitations. Most of the shooting I do is between, I don't know, 11 and 15 power, 12 and 15, something like that. It's one of the reasons I like 3 to 15 scopes so much for general purpose use. And in low light, I'm going to go further down, shooting off hand standing, I'll go further down and all that. I do like having high magnification available for the same reasons we just described, perversely. If there is a lot of mirage and I'm out in the desert, well, that's pretty much my only way to try to get some idea what's happening with the wind. And mm -hmm. I will be able to see mirage and evaluate what happens with it on high magnification much better. If there is some random vegetation out there that hasn't yet dried out from UV exposure and it's moving with the wind, <laughs> I'll have a better, easier time of seeing it on high magnification than a low magnification. 
when I choose a rifle scope for a particular application, especially for precision rifle, I basically start with thinking, okay, how low of a magnification am I going to need? If you talk about, you know, say PRS guys, practical precision guys, uh, they shoot at comparatively large plates, although they're not that large. Um, but they shoot in complicated conditions at unknown distances uh, and stuff like that, which, which makes it uh, fairly difficult. If you talk to them, I don't think you'll ever find one who has ever used magnification less than eight or nine or thereabouts. They just don't go that far down. For example, for all the 5 to 25 scopes, that are very, very good that people have been using for a long time, but they never really go for that application down to five. Right. So there isn't really much downside in using a 7 to 35 instead of a 5 to 25 scope because you never go below 7 anyway. And high magnification might be useful occasionally if you don't shoot on the highest magnification very much. Does okay. making some sort of sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I mean, for what I have done thus far, 16 to 20 seems to be a good range for me and what mm -hmm. I do. But okay. You get off the ground a little bit higher and a higher magnification will work better. Uh, correct, right. So if I'm shooting across a canyon I can, and I have a good shooting position, I can use high magnification uh, uh, sometimes. If, um, but for example, uh, you know, I often shoot alone and if I need to spot my own shots, I'm going to dial back down on magnification. I have an easier chance to see how badly I missed if magnification is lower. I'll be able to see the splash, right, a wider field of view. Right. Is not you know, off of the side picture uh, right. quite as much. It really varies. I'm willing to compromise on high magnification if I need more on the low end. But if I don't, high end can be useful. If I'm shooting with somebody, oftentimes I will not bring a spotting scope. I'll just use my rifle scope to spot. Okay. So, And modern high quality rifle scopes, you know, on 30, 35, 40 power, give you really exceptional image quality. Okay. And uh, I don't believe we said, I guess the tube diameter doesn't necessarily correlate to depth of field either. It could be narrow or wide. Uh, not too much, no. Okay. So what, what would correlate to a narrower depth of field? So shallower. The term is shallower depth of field. Shallower, okay. For depth of field, you, you talk shallow. For field of view, you talk narrow or wide. For depth of field, you say shallow or deep. Um, the length of the scope makes a big difference. The shorter the optic, the harder it is to make a forgiving depth of field. Mm, okay. Um, but the depth of field can be limited by a variety of different things. There are three different optical systems in front in, in the rifle scope. Uh, objective, basically from turrets forward. Uh, erector system, where magnification happens, that's between the eyepiece and the turrets and the eyepiece itself. And then there is a fourth optical system that's outside of the rifle scope. It's called your eye. Uh, in lower light, when your eye pupil dilates, the depth perception of your eye goes down, and that can become a limiting factor. Mm, okay. So yeah. all of these things can matter. Typically, the depth of field uh, is limited um, by a combination of the objective uh, lens system and the erector, okay, how they jive together, and all that and the overall uh, uh, length is what's going to limit the depth of field at each magnification okay all right now we had or you had mentioned earlier that you know to be able to move stuff inside a, a larger diameter tube helps with that mm -hmm. and i i have noticed that looking at rifle scopes for me for shooting a competition I would rather not have an illuminated reticle because I, I've noticed in comparison that you lose some travel vertically when you have an illuminated reticle. Now, what is inside the scopes that is causing these things to lose travel? No? Which scope? <laughs> uh, oh, Talking about I, the same model, illuminated, non illuminated, because different amount of travel? Yeah. Uh, you're talking Leopold Mark Fives or something? Um, I would have to go back and look. I just, it was something I picked up on and I 
don't recall which ones. I think it was more than one, but I could be. Yeah, I thought it was so more than generally one. Generally speaking, the way so there are a couple of different ways to illuminate a reticle. With most of them, it will make no difference for the elevation travel. Okay. All right. So there is one where the way it is assembled, it's slightly bulkier, so you would need a little bit more space for it. So that might limit it. Um, I'd be very curious where what you noticed. Uh, you know, uh, if you don't remember, shoot me an email after this. I'm, I'd like to see. Yeah, Generally I'll go back speaking, in. The reticle elimination sh should make... I mean, once again, it takes space, right? You need real estate to add right. reticle elimination. Not much. And it can be implemented in different ways. But it's typically not a big impact on elevation travel. Okay. And on top of it, you know, there is also well, this big thing. So we... It's once again, it's become a nice marketing thing. So, oh, my scope has 40 mil radian of adjustment. <laughs> I'm going to talk in mil radian just for you. Sure. Um, and, and the other scope has 35 mil radian of adjustment. And you'll have two guys on the internet. Uh, you know, if, if it was in person, then it would probably come to blows. And neither one has ever dialed more than six. Right. Right. How much elevation adjustment do you really need? And you have to keep in mind that optics, everything is a compromise, right? So, if you are insisting that you must have 40 mil radian of elevation adjustment and you invest in a scope like that, what did you compromise? If it's just money, fine. So you paid for being stupid. That's okay. Uh, uh, what else did you compromise, right? So, for example, uh, it's much easier in principle to make a higher image quality on a budget if you don't have a huge elevation adjustment range and make an objective lens slightly bigger. Oh, that's mm. a longer objective lens, simply a little bit longer. Uh, all else being equal, it will cut down a little bit on your elevation adjustment range, but it will make it more consistent and it's going to be easier to achieve better image quality. Would you rather have a scope with 40 mil radian of adjustment and mediocre image quality or a scope that's an inch longer, has 25 mil radian of adjustment and two steps above image quality for the same money? Uh, I'll take option B. Correct, right? And I completely made up the options, right? I'm just giving you right. an example. But everything is a compromise. Um, if you're just shopping on specs, you might be missing something. On the other hand, no, I, what is, this is the new Vortex uh, Strike Eagle. I think it's Strike Eagle. Damn, I already scratched it up. Shit. Uh, 318 by 44. It has like 40 something <laughs> mil radian of adjustment. I actually really like this scope. Oh, but what wow. I'm going to have been mostly using for it was in a precision rim fire where I really needed that elevation adjustment. It's perfect. Right. Right. But if I go and put it onto a crossover hunting rifle where this scope would actually do really well, okay, I'm never going to dial. I'm going to. Yeah, put you'll it, never be close. 243 Winchester, and I'm never going to dial more than 5 mil radian, 6 mil radian. Was it gets to right. a thousand yards and about seven and a half mils? Something like that. So. so it's pun intended overkill. <laughs> it's over travel. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's move on to um, objective lens um, and the eye lens. You, in one of the podcasts, or it may have been multiple ones, actually, you talked about focusing the um, eye lens at the lowest possible magnification and not the highest. Uh, so it's called the, it's not called the, once again, I'm, I will shamelessly correct you left, right, and sideways. Sure. So if it offends you, I consider it your problem. Uh, it's called an eyepiece. Okay. Not the eye lens. Eye lens like is a lens that's, it's the last lens in the eyepiece that's closest to you, but there are usually four or five lenses in the eyepiece. It's a whole optical system. Okay. Uh, the reason is eye dilation. Uh, well, there are two, two things you need to do there. Uh, one is that you don't necessarily need to uh, focus it on the lowest magnification. Once again, that pertains mostly to front focal plane scopes. What happens with front focal plane scopes is that on high magnification, the reticle is quite bold. And when you're adjusting the eyepiece, what you're doing is that you're trying to adjust it so that the reticle looks sharp. The catch is that if, it's, if your eye sees something very bold, your brain will sharpen it. It's very hard to figure out where the actual image coming in is at its sharpest because your brain does such a good and such a quick job of making it look sharp. Your brain does sharpening inside, just like the camera or your cell phone does right. sharpening inside. As you lower the magnification, the front focal plane scope, so the reticle starts getting smaller. And you get to the point somewhere in there where the reticle is still, you know, different reticle features are still clearly visible, but they're fairly small. 
If you start adjusting the eyepiece there, it's going to be much easier to figure out where it's sharp or where it's not. Because, it, because it's not so prominent, your brain doesn't clean up the image quite as rapidly and quite as well. And you can actually figure out what the right setting is. Okay. All okay. right. Another thing you want to do while we're on it is that you want to do this in not very bright light. You want your eye pupil to be a little bit dilated for this. Because the mm. image quality you see gets, excuse me, gets worse when you're with your eye pupil dilated. And the depth of field of your eye gets shallower when your eye pupil is a little bit dilated. Not so narrower, but shallower. Shallower. <laughs> see, learning has occurred. Yeah, we'll talk in a week, see if you retain anything. <laughs> the abuse okay. never stops, okay? <laughs> okay, so maybe so look, I'm, I'm would be better. I'm about optics class in college in Texas probably <laughs> next year. Say a prayer for my students. Oh, uh, okay. I like it. I may have to enroll. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a long separate conversation about politics and stupidity we're going to have later. But... Uh, um, <laughs> So what happens is that uh, the depth of uh, fe uh, the depth of vision of your eye gets shallower. What happens if your eye pupil is really contracted? You see everything very clearly, and your eye will be compensating for the eyepiece not being not not being perfectly adjusted. When you let mm. your eye pupil dilate a little bit and its depth of field goes shallower, it becomes less forgiving of the misadjusted eyepiece. Okay. Okay. So what happens is that if you adjust your eyepiece during the day, sometimes in low light, you'll find yourself that it's not perfectly adjusted. If you adjust it in like, not very low light, right, in like dusk when your eye, eye, eye pupil is a little bit dilated, it will still be perfectly fine adjusted during the day, but uh, across a range of lighting conditions, it'll work better. So do you think maybe um, adjusting it indoors where maybe it's not as bright might be a, a better That's option? That's one of the ways to do it, yes. Okay. So um, adjusting it indoor, it depends on how you adjust it. There are different ways of doing it. You can do it indoors. You can do it outdoors during, you know, as the uh, light starts setting a little bit. Right. Uh, what I usually do, you know, I mostly shoot uh, during the day. And I will go and adjust it, get it close, and then I'll do fine tuning and worse lighting conditions. Okay. Now this, that, focus and then having an image focus adjustment knob um mm -hmm. that's how you get there's always a lot of talk about parallax and parallax mm -hmm. is just putting the two images together in basically the same plane um putting the image from the objective lens system onto the, the same reticle plane as the reticle in the front focal plane right yes so Making sure, and, and this is why I was focusing on the eyepiece mm -hmm. <laughs> with this, is getting that in as crisp as possible and then having a side focus adjustment should put those theoretically in the same plane, correct? At the given magnification, yes. Right. Okay. And then, you, so there, that therefore would negate parallax as being an issue. Uh, allegedly, yes. <laughs> all right i had a question about glass quality mm -hmm. because i i see scope manufacturers advertising oh we put hoya glass in our um rifle scopes Purple. is hoya that great or <laughs> here we here we go we're breaking out the uh vodka i like it <laughs> i don't drink vodka <laughs> uh, that's irish whiskey i actually don't drink vodka i'll take you for that matter Okay. So, no, there is not. Could you give me one second? Sorry. You got to admit, he draws a nice image. Way better than me. So, there are several companies that make optical glass. Hoya, O'Hara, um, Shot. The largest is probably the Chinese company called CBGD, CBDG, something like that. Uh, between high-quality manufacturers like Hoya, O'Hara, Shot, etc., they all make huge catalog of different glasses. Chances are, uh, different lenses in your rifle scope actually made from different, uh, different, different chemically different glass, right? So one of the ways you do these optical optimization when you're trying to correct 
for various aberrations, you know, geometric or uh, chromatic, etc., you are using uh, lens elements made from different types of glass. And pretty much all of these manufacturers make, uh, you know, sh uh, shot or Hoy or Hara catalog will have hundreds, if not thousands, of different glass mounts, all the slightly different wow. compositions. Okay. Mm. okay. So, uh, some will be more expensive, some will be less expensive. The more expensive ones sometimes because they have exotic uh, chemical elements in them, but also oftentimes you can request a particular grade of purity, clarity, so there are few, you know, less stuff to scatter, that kind of stuff. If you have a competent optical designer, there's no practical difference if he specifies glass from Schott or from Hoya or from O'Hara or from Kyocera. From, there are some crappier glass makers out there um, but nobody, maybe there's some crappy ones in China. I don't know if China is very opaque in that regard. But by and large, if you have a competent optical designer, he will specify the, for each lens element, he will specify what glass type it should be made out of, what the exact curvatures are, what the surface quality is, etc., etc., etc. If that is done well, it makes no difference where the glass came from. Okay. Now, um, I will amend that very slightly. So for some very low dispersion types of glass, they are not necessarily identical from different manufacturers. So all the high-end manufacturers make this type of glass, but they're not necessarily interchangeable. The more common types are absolutely interchangeable. But for example, there are some unusual characteristics of a particular glass that O'Hara makes. It's not a Japanese company. Well, I know it sounds Irish, but it's actually Japanese. <laughs> uh, uh, there is a particular type of glass they make that, to the best of my knowledge, there is no direct replacement from shot, right? But shot on the same quality level makes a different, chemically slightly different glass that performs spectacularly well. There is no direct replacement for for it on the O'Hara side. And okay. if worldwide there is enough demand for that type of glass, they'll make one, right? They all, they're all capable. Okay. All right. I've always wondered. I've seen that. And I'm like, does it really matter? Now I know. Most often, people in their marketing use uh, uh, say that they use shot glass, trying to justify higher price, something like that. And then it's marketing. Uh, okay. You know, some of my friends in the business who do this will now be upset with me, and that's okay. All right. They'll live. Now, I've seen also we'll call it marketing in people's marketing. Um, paraphernalia i've seen stuff about our coatings give x percent of light transmission that's where mm -hmm. i was going with the heller yeah, yeah. when when i was in and teaching we called it heller h-e-l-r high efficiency low reflecting Correct. coating and you nurdle was claiming 92 percent light transmission with that coating for so i'm asking the full scope? total for the scope okay so that's do the are there actual coatings out there that matter or is that another marketing uh, coating? Thing? No, coatings matter greatly. Okay, um, but they're not really a differentiating feature anymore because pretty high quality coatings are absolutely commoditized. You can have uh, the lenses made and ship them off to a coater and they'll put all sorts of sophisticated stuff on them. It's not that hard anymore. Used to be, uh, not anymore. In the inertial oh, okay. days, you know that was actually quite good. Uh, but inertial is also optically very simple scope, so it's pretty easy to have high light transmission. Um, but um, so the term high efficiency uh, coatings is, is not something I've used, I've seen very much, to be honest with you. They're just anti reflection coatings, arc, that's a very common term. Uh, for rifle scopes with the optics, we use somewhat broadband coatings. You're basically trying to uh, have them work across a broad color spectrum for the entire visible range. Okay. And how much they transmit, in principle, is not that important. What is very important is how little they reflect. Mm, okay. So um, if, if the scope lets through 92% of the light or 90% or 88%, your eye probably won't make a difference. Won't see it. But what it will see is that from every uh, glass to air interface, a little bit of the light is reflected. When it is reflected, where does it go? Ideally, you want to go to the site and get baffled somewhere, but that's not what happens. What happens uh, most of the time is that it goes back and starts reflecting back and forth from other glass surfaces. And overall, all that light bouncing around can wreak havoc on the image fidelity if it's not well managed. 
it's some it's something called stray light uh, problems um i'm sure you've mm. seen this thing called veiling flare uh every once in a while when you shoot into the sunrise or into the sunset it's like a veil falls over the image everything looks whited out a little bit yes so that's exactly that phenomenon right so your target is comparatively dark there is a very bright light source behind it and when that light comes in it reflects off of something starts bouncing around eventually it makes it to your eye but that uh stray light is so powerful that even those couple of percent that may be reflected in there are enough to drown out and screw up the contrast of the target you actually tried to hit oh interesting now uh, i had, same thing I had with, go ahead i was gonna say i had something happen like that with a red dot site but mm -hmm. i'll bring that up when we get there okay so let's 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 red dots are separate issues so let's talk about yeah that completely separate <laughs> um for example uh, have you ever heard the term called ghost image if you're uh, yes, shooting I have. light and you somehow got the moon within your field of view all of a sudden you'll see a fainter version of the moon somewhere in the image as well that's also basically this reflection business. You're shooting fairly low light. The moon is much brighter than the ambient uh, environment. And that slight reflection of it bounces around a couple of times. It can accidentally form a coherent image. Sometimes it will just screw things up. Everything looks faded out. Uh, sometimes it will just bounce off. Okay. So don't shoot when the moon is brighter than the ambient light. That's what we uh, You know, right? you can shoot, but you <laughs> shoot with a scope that controls all these reflections well. Okay. So for that, if you have very high quality coatings, less stuff is reflected and you will have fewer issues. Coatings is not the only thing that controls it. You also need baffles in there the way so that, for example, if, the, if there are shiny spots on any of the internal mechanical structure in the scope, this light coming off of the lenses will bounce off of something bright, metallic and really go all over the place. So you want everything uh, inside black and so that it absorbs stray light and things like that okay I mean, there are people who get their phd in optics just on controlling straight light just that one thing is enough to get a few doctorates here and there wow okay all right now you and i do have something in common we don't like busy you're switching to emrad <laughs> what's that oh no you're switching to the radians <laughs> yeah uh no no no, no. Okay. so not but that much in common okay yeah neither one of us likes a busy reticle uh not terribly busy yes right um now these these christmas tree or horus reticles i i can't even i mean it, it like activate something in my it so triggers christmas me in tree, some way. horus is not the same horus is not a christmas tree reticle okay horus is what's called a grid reticle uh, Christmas tree radical is just basically think of uh, let's say I don't know go look on tangent theta gen 3 XR it's a good example of Christmas tree radical vortex is EBR 7 it's basically uh, the stuff below the thing comes, comes out down. like this so as you have so you can do both elevation and wind compensation using the radical if you if that gets extended all over the place and you have horizontal and vertical lines everywhere that becomes a grid radical gotcha i prefer something simple like a mill dot um mm -hmm. but you as you stated earlier you have designed um a reticle quite a few so, for different people yes okay how which style do you use when you create a reticle um well it depends on what the what the what the, what type of shooting they go for i've done christmas tree style reticles i've done simpler meal hash style reticles kind of an extension of a mill dot uh, okay. with half a 0.2 mil holes uh, the most common for precision shooting right now is reticle based on 0.2 mil radian as a base uh, as a base uh, measure that's you know that's very common okay i've done a few both ways uh, look i mean busy fairly comparatively busy reticles have their place for people who use a reticle to shoot for different applications, different shooting styles, etc. Right, PRS uh, being one of them. Uh, some people in PRS dial 100% of the time, and some do both. I do both. Though not that much of a PRS shooter. I do. I both use a reticle and dial, depending on what I'm doing. Sometimes I'll do both. Sometimes if I want to hit three targets at let's say six, seven, eight hundred yards, and I need to do it comparatively quickly, uh, people who who have better and more stable shooting position can do a lot of dialing I'm not very good at it so I'll dial let's say for a 
uh, 700-yard uh, target. And then when I transition to 6 and 800, I'll just use radicals to hold, the radical to hold for that transition, for example, right? So, okay. so there are different ways of doing this. Uh, I'm not saying that my way is the best. What I'm saying is that enough people do this where you can easily use different styles. The basic problem with the radical like Horus is that it's basically a mosquito net in a scope. Um, it has a ton of crap mm -hmm. that nobody really uses. If you add a feature to a radical, it needs to be useful, right? And if we are talking about front focal plane radicals, and that's why I do the grid star radicals, I have no use for any of the complicated radicals in a second focal plane. Right. In front focal plane, you can make use out of them. You have to, there are certain basic design rules that you have to adhere, and Horus basically breaks all of them. <laughs> okay. Uh, one is that there are particular symmetries you want to follow because when you're tired your eye looks for certain symmetries and if they're broken you'll start shifting your aim a little bit left or right uh, you want to have a primary aiming point that's well defined because when you go low magnification the reticle gets thinner the primary aiming point is you, 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 that's what you're going to be using because you're not going to be using all the holdovers and wind holds at low power and you when you're introducing the complexity meaning the christmas tree portion stuff like that you want to add things that that you will need and don't add anything that you won't and if there is a question you may or may not need it, it's probably better to not add it so err on the side of simplicity some of my designs that didn't quite follow the last rule because marketing is marketing and a lot of people want hmm. more than they're actually going to use Right. I've right. never had, I've never had, I've never designed a radical that was perfect for me, for example, because that would be too sparse of a tree for the modern market. And so in practical terms, for example, in the precision scope, but I, where I do like Christmas tree style radicals, I almost never hold more than three mil radian away from center. Nine MOA for you, right? So if you imagine the center of the radical, nine MOA circle like this. What? I thought I that was 10. Did. I thought that I was 10.8. Three mil radian, isn't that 10.8? Uh, it's so one mil radian is 3.438 uh, MOA. So, so it's 10.3. 10 point, 10 point so it's two. Yeah, 10.3. Uh, uh, roughly. I, okay. So I, I just judge, judge the three roughly, <laughs> right? So <laughs> regardless, you. that's the that's the ballpark. And I don't like to be aiming that far away from center if I can help it. Once again, the that's way we aim way. is much better to aim with the center. On low power variable scopes where I, I'm not going to twist the turrets, and if I take it to 1,000 yards, which I've done, and I have a 12 mil radian tree, I'll be aiming 12 mil radian away from center. That can happen. But for a precision scope, I will not. So the ideal radical, for example, for me would be something with a very, very small tree that's only about you know three mil radian down or thereabouts, maybe three or four, and a couple of mil radian of holes, and that's it, and everything else I can be empty. But that's absolutely not a marketable radical because you can't sell it. Uh, right. Eighty percent of the people who buy this stuff uh, will never shoot past the hundred yards at the, the square range. Right? They just want to have a cool radical to show their friends. <laughs> and I agree. Okay. Yeah. That's why I'm so, not a fan of busy reticles. All right. Uh, within reason. But once again, they have their place. People do use them. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, uh, you know, the, and there is a way to find them so that they don't interfere with a more a traditional type shooting that you do. Because uh, you can make the tree or even the grid compared to an obtrusive. For example, the uh, Schmidt and Bender 6 to 36 scope that's going to be here in a couple of weeks. That's a new long range design. The radical I requested that I really like is their version of the grid radical. It's called GR2ID. They just say grid radical. On paper, it looks very busy, but when you shoot with it, they did such an exceptional job of having that grid kind of stay out of the way, the reason that unobtrusive when you don't need it. It okay. looks busy on paper, and then when you use it in the scope, I've used it in the scope, it's actually really good. They did like the okay. way they sized it, they did such an excellent job, right? So there is a way to design this. You just have to, you know, you just have to pay attention and not listen to the marketing people 100% of the time. Gotcha. Okay. Now I'd like to kind of, I feel like we've covered rifle scopes pretty good. Okay. I'd like, I'd like to move down to the low power variable optics. 
are these basically just smaller rifle scopes or are we talking about a completely different design set no just smaller rifle scopes all right no, that's how... all, the, all the same fundamentals okay but they're going they with are rifle scopes, just small ones right now they're doing a much smaller objective lens Correct. so are we are we talking about any change in a shallower depth of field or a a deeper depth uh, of field? so generally small objective lens means all else being equal means a larger depth of field the larger okay. the objective the smaller the shallower the depth of field so think of a since you're used to the photography think of an objective lens of a rifle scope as like the lens on a camera it has an f number the f number is a diameter uh right. focal length divided by the diameter right so for low power variable scopes the uh, objective lenses are fairly short but the diameter is also small so the right. f number stays in a sim somewhat similar range sometimes even higher f number so the depth of field is reasonably forgiving with these lpvos i mean they're extremely popular especially especially for um, like multi-gun competition three mm -hmm. gun that type of stuff where you're not shooting out at particularly long distances um, but as for the stuff we've just talked about, like, um, well, we just mentioned depth of, of field, but also clarity, light, and all of that stuff, how much of a degradation are we talking in comparison to these other full-size rifle scopes? I mean, they're also lower magnification, right? It goes hand in hand. Um, you can use a low power variable scope and low light just fine. You just need to keep it on moderate magnification, you know, three, four power, something like that. And it works surprisingly well if the rest of the scope is designed well. The reason they have small objective lenses is that they need to go down to one power. There are technical reasons, which have a video on that, um, why uh, it's very hard to do a larger objective if you want to have unity magnification on the low end. Okay. And you have to keep in mind the low uh low power variable optics are designed the way they are for one reason one reason only to give you a reasonably good performance on one power and everything you get higher than that is gravy okay, uh, okay. right um the reason for low power variable optics is the opposite of specialization the reason for low power variable lpvos is flexibility the basic idea you put uh, you set up your rifle with the if you want to go really fast you set up your rifle with the red dot on holographic right if you want precision you, you pop a bigger scope on it more modification larger objective etc even for gas guns right let's say you have an accurate air 15 you want to use for everything uh, you put a low power variable optic on it when you don't know what you're going to face gives you kind of the best of both worlds it's uh, you know you know you know there is a uh, compromise yeah it's a compromise but you know there's this famous uh, uh phrase jack of all trades or master, master of none. not right yep but that's not a full phrase right it also ends is that that's still pretty good at everything <laughs> right it, it's like uh, who's that was it the heptathlete yeah uh, something like that i actually used i wrote an article on that for guns and ammo i actually used that phrase and now the exact uh, phrasing escapes me i can probably pull that up somewhere I, li I really like that phrase because it's always when it's um, when it's used. Uh, it's they all they never use the whole phrase. Right. Give me one sec. I'm gonna find you the exact wording. Uh, this is the kinds of normal stuff. I've written so much stuff over the years that sometimes is it's difficult to figure out which is which. Is this it? No. No. No, I think it was last year. Other, oh, I think this is it. If I can't find it, I'll have to uh, dig that up at a later point. Okay. I'm not at the point I've written so much stuff over the years that I actually don't remember the exact thing I said in every one of them. But that was a very poignant conclusion that I was very proud of, and I'm trying to find it. I think it's something uh, jack of all trades, master of none, but still better than having none or something like that. Mm, okay. Here's the idea, right? So if if you have your precision rifle and somebody is 15 feet away from you, that's probably not super helpful if your lowest magnification is 10 power. 
Still better than the club, but not by much. If you have mm. a red dot and you're pushing 50 like I am and you need to hit something a little further out and the dot is looking squirrel in there, it's probably not ideal. Low power variable will do all of that for you. The um, It's funny you mentioned that because I shot a target 15 feet from me at Aberdeen that was chasing me. I had a raccoon chasing me. <laughs> and and when I started heading back to the gun, I heard we were we had a pause in shooting. For, I think mm -hmm. there was aircraft overhead or something. And um, we went live again, and that's when the raccoon started chasing me. Well, I beat it to the Barrett, and at fifteen <laughs> at fifteen yards, all I could see was <laughs> hair. So I I. Okay. You the make a shot with the bear, you know, it speaks well of you, but it's not an ideal. Like I said, it's better than no. nothing, right? Yes, it's, it's better than a club. <laughs> uh, you know, once a year, I like to do this uh, thought experiment. What if I could only have one, one, one rifle to do more or less everything that I do, right? So sort of a hellish nightmare scenario. Uh, I can do damn near everything I want to do with an AR-15 chambered form, six and a half Grendel with a one to 10 low power variable on it. Would I be able to shoot better at long distance with a larger scope? Yeah, but I can still make the shot. Will it be mm -hmm. as good a low light as a low light specialist scope? No, but it's going to be much better than a naked eye. It's going to be as fast across the room as a red dot? No, but it's pretty decent. All right. If you don't know what you're going to face, you're looking for flexibility. Now, what is the compromise with those, like a one and a half to 10? Mm -hmm. I don't feel like that's a, a 34 millimeter tube, but I haven't looked at them that closely either. So I feel like there are going to be some compromise, or do they... Yeah, you're what, your what one and a half to 10 I'm talking about? Well, when we're talking um, uh, the March, magnification one factors... To it's one and a half to 15. It's a 34 millimeter tube, and it's a 42 millimeter objective. Oh, okay. So it's a large uh, objective and a larger so tube. Magnification is multiplicative. That means that the difference between one and one and a half is about the same as between 10 and 15. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. I see that. So well, between one and one and a half is actually a big difference in terms of speed at close range. Um, one and a half is still pretty good. You can go fairly fast with one and a half. Um, but uh, there is a reason why people want unity magnification, low power for speed. And again, just doing a cursory look as I have in the past, and maybe things are changing, but it seemed like at one time most of the LVPOs were second focal plane. LPVOs, yes. Yeah. Second focal plane is a little bit easier, yeah. Okay. Is it just easier to manufacture? Is that what it is? Uh, it's a little easier to manufacture. The physical size of the reticle in the front focal pen is very, very small. And what happens, because it's very small, it's very hard to make it illuminate it brightly. Okay. There's technology for that. There's a Swiss company called IMT that does something called diffractive reticles. So again, I did a couple of videos, articles on that. Um, they have a technology to make a front focal pen reticle illuminate it uh, very brightly. The catch is that if you're trying to get something that approximates the speed of the red dot, or at least get close to it, uh, you want to have very brightly illuminated reticle, I, uh, preferably center dot, like Vortex Razor Gen 2, 1 to 6 is a very good example of that. It's a fiber okay. illuminated dot, it's your dot, it's nuclear bright, it's a very well designed eyepiece, very forgiving to get behind. Pop it on one, it may probably still the fastest of all LPVOs on one power. But the fiber illuminated dot will not work in the front focal plane. You can't build it in the front focal plane reticle. So it has to be the second focal plane. Ah, uh, okay. And on top of that, if you think about a lot of the uh, advantages, disadvantages of front focal plane, second focal plane, depending on how far you shoot for a low power variable, it may not matter that much, right? So I, with low power variables also, I sort of prefer... Sure about that. I sort of prefer front focal plane because I, I think of them as essentially DMR scopes in many ways, you know, designated marksman. Because yep. a modern designated marksman in this case is basically an accurate semi auto that can be brought upon to do everything in the pinch, right? What we think of as a modern DMR scope as an accurate AR 15 or AR 10, whatever mm -hmm. it might be. I don't hugely like large frame ARs in most cases, so for me, it's AR 15. And uh, you're going to use it for everything, right? 
So Correct. for me, low power LPVO is a near ideal scope uh, for that because everything that I do, I can do with LPVO because that rifle I will use to shoot a little further out. I actually prefer them in front focal plate uh, with somewhat more complicated reticles. And the advantage, interesting advantage of front focal plane design here is that when you go on low power, the reticle complexity fades out of you, it becomes small. And you can have other reticle features look prominent for speed and one power. If it's a second focal plane reticle, you make it complicated enough to shoot further out, it's always complicated in front of you. Mm. And it will actually uh, may be detrimental for speed. So, but on the other hand, if you're plan is to use this rifle within, let's say, I don't know, 300 yards, roughly MPBR of a rifle. There's no reason for you to spend the money on the front focal plane LPVO. The nice ones are still expensive, right? And second focal plane will work just great. Yeah, I almost feel like you could just zero your weapon for point blank out to 300 and for the most part, uh, or close yeah, to it. I mean, depending on the cartridge and all that, but yeah, you can. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the, the so the way it works, a lot of these um, come with various BDC reticles, and you know BDC by definition is not for precision shooting. Mm -mm. And uh, what's going to happen is that if you are shooting, think you'll be shooting out to three hundred yards or so, or four hundred, whatever pick a distance, figure out which hash mark corresponds to that distance, and with your ammo, sight in that hash mark at that distance, you'll accumulate some errors at closer ranges. But in terms of the actual hold on target, there was going to be progressively smaller errors. So everything Correct. from 400 and in is going to be close enough. In most cases, there are some exceptions. But knowing how to use a ballistic calculator in, in this case is very helpful. It'll get you close. No, but is there... I didn't have much in the LPVO section. Is there anything else we should talk about before we move on to red dot sites and other things? Oh, it's not a huge amount. Um, I wrote a few articles okay. on how to focus the eyepiece on them. It's a little bit different than conventional scopes. So there are reference materials okay. out there. Um, you want to focus the eyepiece on one power. And basically, you want to adjust the eyepiece so that the image looks as close to perfect unit magnification as possible. Right. And on high magnifications, if that ends up in slightly non-optimal focus, you just live with it. Because okay. eyepiece not being adjusted correctly on one power can be a significant difference for speed. Gotcha. So for those people watching or listening, if you go to darklordofoptics.com, you can find all of his articles. You may there's have to that, scroll. But... There's guns and ammo, there's shooting illustrated, there's a bunch of other stuff. So I've covered it left, right, and sideways from different angles for the last several years because that's where the questions are. Now, do you have a video on your YouTube channel? of it more or than, just more articles than one. okay more than one. all right so there's your third option yeah there <laughs> third <is>. option <laughs> yeah. until they ban me eventually they will <laughs> okay now red dot sites i want to go back for a minute mm -hmm. i had a um i had a vortex red dot on my pistol and shot a match two weekend or two months in a row First weekend of the month, 30 days later, shot another one and had the looking the exact same direction at almost the exact same time on a certain stage looking into the sun. I had um, I, I had some type of reflection to where the light came in the front of the red dot site and it must have hit the emitter and reflected back onto the glass. And all I saw literally was. If you're looking at the screen, the picture of me would be all red. Like I could not see through it. Mm -hmm. It was just a solid curtain of red. Am I correct in surmising that I'm getting a reflection off the emitter and it's getting stuck on the inside portion of the glass or, or any ideas what in the world that was? Because I called Vortex and they were like, we've never heard of that. Uh, yeah, that's a weird one. So for it to hit the emitter, you have to be absolutely perfectly aligned on the sun, and which is extremely unlikely. Uh, what more than likely happened is that, uh, did you use different shooting glasses or glasses in those two days? Nothing was different. Literally so nothing you, was different. And uh, you saw that, that, ex that phenomenon as you turned, or was it only one particular direction? It was only in that one exact 
direction. Everything else was fine. As soon as I moved the angle away, mm -hmm. it disappeared. It was yeah. only so in more, that one angle. Likely what happened uh, was that there was you managed to find this one spot where <laughs> the sun was one perfect angle where the sun hit your eyeglasses. You reflected from your eyeglasses just enough of it uh, to hit the lens from the inside. Focus mm. on the emitter, bounce back from the emitter, and give you that red glow. Really? Okay. Yes. That well, is the well, most well. likely possibility. Okay. Very interesting. So I so need the, low reflective coatings on my so, glasses. So the way the way those things uh, work, the lens and the red dot side is a sandwich. There are two lens elements that are curved, that are kind mm -hmm. of concave like this. Between them is this coating that reflects red. Okay right so um to all the other colors it's not a lens it's like a window it's a curved window but both sides are parallel to each other it's like looking through a flat uh, looking through essentially a flat piece of glass on the inside of the red dot there is an emitter that's that emits red light and this curved surface with reflect uh, with a coating that only reflects red essentially adds uh, works as a curved mirror mirrors can be used to focus light and stuff like that and that basically reflects the dot back to your eye as a collimated beam and your eye reconstructed back into a dot okay so if you were seeing red it had to come from your side of the lens because from the if the sun is shining onto the lens from the front a red from the sun would be reflected forward not to not to you it had to be light okay. coming from the side of your head very interesting okay and who do you talk to at vortex um i don't remember i just called uh customer support okay well, if you, if you so, remember the name, I'll be in Vortex in a week and a half. I'll explain it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's it. You're the first one to ever have an answer, so I, I like it. It's That's not, very interesting. Like I told you, it's not that complicated. You just have to think about it. All right. Now, the other, the next one I have is, um, so I have a Trigicon RMR, um, but the one that doesn't use a battery. Mm -hmm. So it uses tritium um and solar oh yeah and the fiber collector right and i have an sro i have a viridian rfx 35 that's a green dot and i have the vortex and like the sro Which sometimes venom I don't... viper razor um it, it's either going to be a venom or a viper i don't recall is it came the, with is my the window slightly wider than the base or is it same with as a base I, I don't know. I took it off and put it on a 22 pistol that my my sons would shoot. So it's down okay. in the right. in the okay. safe. So I haven't shot well, it in years. One of them. Okay. Right. Um, but I've noticed, and even talking to other people, one of the things we always talk about is you know which dot looks most concentric. Mm -hmm. Now is that due to what you're talking about? Just the angle shape of the glass. And the reflection that creates the the non concentric image and sometimes multiple dots, what would be the cause of that? Uh, mostly, so part of it is the shape of the lens, and part of it is your eye. If you have a mild astigmatism, and given that uh, you are, you don't you don't quite look eighteen to me, you probably do. Uh, I'm nineteen. Um, yeah. No. <laughs> uh, it's it's based, once again i just wrote two articles on that for shooting the shit and they're freely available online okay um, it's yeah as you get the segments as you get older your eyes ability to reconstruct a sharp looking dot out of what's coming to your eye becomes worse the side didn't change your eye did uh, most of the modern red dot sites like that use comparatively complicated sorry i'm looking you know there is a mosquito flying around me i'm just waiting for the fucker to land on something <laughs> Um, <laughs> there's going to be a murder in the video <laughs> more than one if he's got buddies um i'm just trying to save him he, he might get poisoned if he bites me uh but uh anyhow um uh, most of them have aspheric surfaces these days if i remember correctly the rmr is one of the few holdouts that uses a simple spherical surface so that will arguably look worse than most others um but yours being uh, uh without batteries it has that very very heavy green tint 
and the reticle is comparatively not as bright unless you're an ultra bright sun correct so that would help it uh, look less distorted but and the it... glass is uh, very tinted the reason it looks less distorted is that it's less bright so if you have a very small dot small spot that is very bright your eye and your brain can't quite, quite figure out what shape it should be so your brain doesn't really get a chance to sharpen it for you if you have mild astigmatism you're using a red dot especially in the pistol what size dot do you use in a pistol i have a five and a three excellent so on the next one go bigger well the rmr is a nine and yeah, it is so that, the most concentric that will use that will help tremendously so larger dot that is not as bright will look sharper okay uh, well, but because true. it's larger it doesn't have to be as bright to be as visible and I, at handgun distances you really don't need a small dot once again that's uh there's this old phrase that became famous through this mel gibson patriot movie aim small miss small it's the largest crock of shit ever perpetrated <laughs> on shooting community aside from the tube size <laughs> right yeah i've heard that a lot yeah <laughs> Oh, yeah. that People still like using that. And the interesting thing, too, is the nine, I pointed it out to a buddy who was at the range with me uh, mm -hmm. recently. You can actually see through the dot Correct. to the target. So it's actually my favorite. But I've also found with my red-green defect mm -hmm. that the greens are much, they're much easier for me to see at low light and they appear more concentric. Correct. Correct. If you have okay. red, uh, red, green bladedness, it, mm, a different color maybe. Uh, Holosun makes some red dot sites. I think they're more rifle ones, but maybe pistol ones as well that are amber in color. Allegedly, for a lot of people with red, green uh, issues, amber dot actually looks better. And in the in the paperwork I've seen, I've only seen one in person that I've played with, and, and I would tend to agree the amber does seem more prominent to me than the red. Sure. But that also means that I can turn the volume down, the brightness is what I mean, Correct. on the green dot versus the red that I have to brighten up in order to see yeah. easier. Correct, yeah. So okay. basically larger dot, less bright, with any color is going to work better, but if it's a color that agrees better with your eyes, you know, just try with that. Um, I really like uh, red dot sites from Shield. It's a you know UK company mm. that make very small RMS yeah. alternative sites. Uh, they have some models where I think either six or eight of my MOA dots. Seymour uh, has very large dots, but uh, I haven't had a chance to try those. Given a choice, I six or eight MOA uh, dots is what is what I like on handguns. Even on rifles, if it's a backup, that's fine as well. Once again, we all tend to think, oh, an eight MOA dot is going to blot out the entire legion of zombie attackers. Okay, eight MOA is approximately eight inches at the hundred yards. Can you shoot within eight inches at a hundred yards with your handgun? Uh, you're a good shot. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, and you and you're a good shot. You have to think about it. Yeah, right? yeah, on yeah rifle, absolutely. On a rifle, offhand, right? Can you hold uh, easily hold uh, on, you know uh, quick fire offhand or even slow fire? It's great. Just you know, not this. This. Can you hold right. easily hold eight or eight hundred yards? Eight or eight anywhere. I think I could with a rifle. Correct. Is it so yeah. easy? Uh, may, may, the more practice you get, the easier it gets. But right. yeah, if, if it's something you don't do very often, so it would be for difficult. me, shooting offhand with a rifle, roughly eight MOA is about as good as I as I can make it, and that's on a good day. On an average day, I'm worse okay. than that offhand. Once again, I'm not a particularly good shot. I started shooting late. I've had, unfortunately, compared to little instruction. And also, but I shoot an awful lot, right? Compared to normal, uh, sane people, I know where my limits are. And I, in a red dot sight and six or eight MOA dot, even on the rifle, would probably not hold me back very much. Okay. Now, I, I experienced recently a shift in zero on one of my red dot sights. Mm -hmm. So what it made me start wondering, I know we all end up going, oh, you need to re-zero and mark on your um, adjustment knobs, you know, where zero is. So if it moves, you know, 
But is it actually a mechanical change in the adjustment knobs or is it something with the emitter? What's happening on a red dot site if, uh, say, after 10,000 rounds? Mechanical? It's mechanical something got loose. So I actually never really looked that carefully into uh, how exactly they implement mechanical adjustments. Mechanical adjustments on red dot sites are generally not very repeatable. So marking it won't do anything for you most more often than not. I believe um, it. They are designed, you kind of pats around with it until it's set, and then you don't touch it. Um, well, unless something breaks. Um, the red dot, the little LED with the mask and everything is surface mounted in a tiny little PCB. And I think when you are changing adjustments, the whole thing moves slightly. Okay. And, and I believe you because I have found that whether it be a Trigicon or the Viridian or even the Vortex, they're not exactly, they say they're one minute of angle adjustments, but they, they don't, yeah, they, they don't seem to match up exactly that way. Because no. I'm like, oh, I'm 15 yards, I'm an inch away, that should be six tick marks, and I'll do six tick marks. I'm like, yeah, that wasn't, that wasn't it yeah, in a way that I moved. And you'll move two tick marks, you'll just two tick marks and nothing moves, and then you just come more and move four. Look, right. it's possible to make red dot sites adjust accurately. But nobody wants to do it. It will take more work and more, uh, and it will take more space. The whole thing will get bulkier and more expensive. And for what? You only do this one when, when you're sighting in. So it's a little bit more pain and suffering while you're sighting in, and then you're fine. <laughs> uh, I like that. All right. Now, you have mentioned several times on other podcasts, you've talked about diminishing returns with scopes lpvos red dot sites all of that mm -hmm. so i wanted to touch on that and see if there's been any change because it's been a couple of years since you've really been on a podcast and talked about it and a couple of years is a lot by way of technology mm -hmm. so you had um that after about 800 dollars on hunting scopes there's you get diminishing returns so maybe if you're looking for something to really do what you want to do without overspending, look about eight hundred dollars. Is that uh, it's still about the same? Ballpark. Yeah, it's about the same. It just depends okay. on what kind of hunting you do, right? Out out east, you don't need that much. Out west, right. here where you need, you know, your shots will be longer. You maybe need a little more. Eight hundred to thousand ballpark. Sometimes a little bit more. Technology uh, does move forward, although the rifle scopes is not exactly cutting edge technology. It's compared to old and simple technology. Um, but, uh, inflation pushes it the other way. So, mm, okay. Right. So and then in this case, I'm not sure who is winning, but 800 to 1000, if you, once again, you don't have to spend a thousand dollars on the hunting scope, uh, to go shoot a white tail at 70 yards in Pennsylvania. Right. Correct. Correct. Uh, but if you happen to be doing it in very low light, I mean, that changes things a little bit. You can buy a reliable hunting scope for a couple hundred. Uh, dollars. The basic idea is that if you want a lot of features, if you want something very full featured, it'll cost you a little money. Okay. If you're the guy who basically goes, okay, I'm just going to build myself a nice hunting rifle. I'm going to equip it the best way I can. I'm just going to go hunt with it for the next decade. And I don't want to mess with it. Uh, the scope is going to cost you likely $800 to $1,000, maybe a little bit more if you want something a little bit fancier. And if you are not a crazy hobbyist, you know, uh, you, should see, you should see how many guns I have. Uh, <laughs> if you're not, uh, if your hobby is hunting, not guns, I mean, that's probably a good way of doing it. Invest once, be done. If you have a gotcha. hundred guns to scope, a thousand dollars on each gun is gonna cost that's you. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. So that you may want to uh, think about it differently. Uh, precision scopes also, it hasn't really changed that much. I think you you get full featured, high quality scopes that maybe not as nice as the alpha stuff, but very, very workable. Uh, not Chinese in this case, in the $1,500 to $1,000 range, if you're willing to go Chinese, you can get away with about $1,200, $1,100, a couple of good ones. China can make very nice scopes. I mean, they're not still not as good as the best stuff from Japan and uh, Germany, uh, but or US, but uh, partly because they're not really building it to that budget. They could build very high quality stuff if they want. If you want Japanese, uh, okay. uh, 
1500 to 2000 is basically where you're not really compromising much and for every compared to a small improvement past that you're paying a fair amount of money now it doesn't mean that it's not worth it right it would be very disingenuous for me, disingenuous for me with the tangent pages and marshes and all that to say it's not worth it it's worth it to me right uh, but it's just for the average fun. consumer it's uh we live in a fairly affluent society right the fact that you can afford to spend it doesn't mean you should so it's just a conversation you have to have with your wife with your wallet <laughs> Uh, with your couch that you may be sleeping on, uh, how much money you're willing to spend on it. The most important part is to think of it as a system. If you buy a tangent data and put it on a $500 rifle that's not bedded well with pot metal yeah. rings, yeah, you're not going to do so great. Uh, right. Think of it as an overall rifle package. You have to have the right rifle it has to be bedded properly you have to use decent ammo a rifle has to shoot adequately well even when it's warm you have to use good quality rings right and you, you and you should have a decent quality scope and where all that is kind of depends how much money you want to spend but if you are planning to put 20 dollar rings on a two thousand dollar scope yeah buy hundred dollar rings and use an, an, an 1900 dollar scope right there we go there's our compromise yeah, the whole thing has to work together. <laughs> right. And you you had um you didn't have any numbers for LPVOs at the time. They've become a little bit more I'll use the word prolific since then. So is there a magic number there? Um depends what you want to do. Uh for a second focal plane scope that I cop. So there has been some stratification with low power variables. Um primary arms just came out with a under four hundred dollar scope with a truly day bright dot. It's the new SLX one to six by twenty four. It's a fiber optic dot, and it actually does very very well. Okay. Um, next step up from that, a uh, couple more second focal plane high quality scopes in the eight hundred to twelve hundred dollar range. Delta Striker, uh, Vortex Razor Gen two, that kind of stuff. Um, I would not pay more than that for a second focal plane LPVO. And if you're looking at it as more of a DMR, designated marksman type scopes, where you want to really push it past uh, the MPBR, the you know, maximum point blank range, and you're going to go FFP, it's basically 1200 and up. Um, oh, wow. There are a lot of scopes that come through my hands. You know, they come and they go a few stages. So I can tell you with LPVOs what has stayed. Uh, the Sai 6 SAI, it's a Canadian company, same company, Stagent Data and Armament Technologies. It's a Japanese made scope, it's a front focal plane, 1 to 6 by 24, that's staying here. Primary Arms BLXC, a 1 to 8 by 24, front focal plane, it's about $1,500. I have two of those. And next step up from there is a Vortex Razor Gen 3, 1 to 10 by 24. It's depending on the deal you get, 22 to 2500 bucks. Ooh. Uh, that's also staying. There are fancy LPVOs out there. I can't quite bring myself to spend that much money. Um, but uh, between these three with front focal plane, these are basically the ones I've chosen to use. And there are some new ones coming that may you know, upset us a little bit. Probably not. The best okay. bait for the buck on balance is probably the primary arms PLXC 1 to 8 because of its very compact, very light, good optical performance, decent radical. Um, if you want a general purpose AR-15, the way to do this, you get an accurate AR-15 and the caliber of your choice, be it 2 to 3. 2 to 3 became viable even for defensive purposes and so for some mild hunting because of the new ammo, 70 grain Barnes TSX ammo is surprisingly effective and a lot of stuff. But basically, if you're setting up a gun like that, your best bet is uh, a lightweight front focal plane LPVO, like the primary arms PLXC 1 to 8 and an offset red dot of some sort, not necessarily mm. for speed, but for redundancy, right? If you're setting up a general purpose gun, the point I always try to get across that nobody listens to is that anything and everything made by man can and does fail usually when you most need it. Right. So the only way to be confident is to have uh, backups and spares uh, with AR-15s that have a straight stock, uh, we would offset a piggyback trend dot sites. Uh, yes, they're slightly faster than even best LPVOs on one power, but the real biggest reason to have one on your gun is redundancy. 
redundancy without having to remove anything. You know, we used to do all this folding back up iron sights. Mm -hmm. Sounded great in principle, but in practice, you have to remove the scope. Correct. If you have time to be removing the scope, I mean, you know, it's not that much of an emergency. But with a piggybacked, I mean, seriously, right? Even yeah. if it's detached mount, etc. If you have time to fuck around with that, it's not an emergency. Uh, in case of an emergency, you want to have a backup sighting system that's there, set it in, set up with offset rifles. All you do is this. Yeah, good, right? Yes. So that's it, the big it, uh, the the one example I can use that I think where it would be a real world situation where it would be more advantageous to have a red dot sight on the side is I've always, I've got guys who, I have friends who like to hunt out in the Western states like Montana and those areas. And I'm like, dude, I don't know why you're, I, I know people carry pistols, but look, I come from a world of carrying two rifles. I am not afraid to carry two rifles. Um, but I've always said, I, and they like to bow hunt. So we're mm -hmm. not even talking two rifles. I said, I would still carry a uh, an AR style rifle for much more power. And I'd put a red dot sight on that thing because if you get startled and you need to <laughs> acquire a target sight rapidly, I think that's the fastest way to do it. And if something as big as that coming at you, uh, a bear, you yeah. need to, yeah, you need to be able to do it under stress in milliseconds. Yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and disagree with you. Okay. You just because I like disagreeing with people. <laughs> uh, uh, no, generally, I, uh, conceptually, I, I, I like it. In practical terms, having hiked up hill with all sorts of shit, including a bow, I'm not looking forward to carrying a rifle uh, as well. The weight itself, I could probably manage with lots of complaining, but I could. Uh, like I said, I'm a large guy. My biggest problem going up hill is my own fat ass. It's not the backpack. <laughs> <laughs> but the problem with the rifle, if you have a bow and a rifle, so how you're gonna carry how you're gonna carry all of that so that you can get your hands on it and deploy it in a hurry. That becomes right. an issue. Uh went to Alaska, you know, did the hunting. I had a chest trick with a handgun when I out west here. When I go hunting with a bow or rifle, I will have a sidearm. The biggest advantage of a sidearm is that you always have it on you. I I've heard plenty of stories of somebody who shot it elk or a moose and started uh, skinning it just to get mauled by a bear and his rifle was leaning by a tree you know six feet away and that was just too far yeah, and, and if, uh, if your elbows that, deep in a, in a moose or an elk your ability to deploy a rifle is minimal it's not great with a handgun either but at least it's on you it's right there and we all practice to get it out right. that, that's why i would not leave my body and, How are you going to be skinning an elk with a rifle? Uh, I would sling it, but it would be on me. It, it, it's probably doable. I would not experiment with it because it will just get old. When, when you're skinning, when you're working on an animal that large that you cannot maneuver the animal, you have to maneuver yourself around the animal. Mm -hmm. uh, you, would, you would do it for about 10 minutes and the rifle would be off of you somewhere. I know you can argue okay. it's a completely hypothetical exercise, but with a handgun... I know it's on me. And I don't disagree with you. Yeah. But I also know that I've seen people shoot a handgun with the only stress being a timer. Mm -hmm. And they've missed wide open targets at close range. So, yeah, And I've seen people do that with a rifle too. It's easier to hit a target with a rifle, but you have to train with either one. And with either one, if you're within eight feet of a bear, the odds are in bear's favor. No matter yeah. what you have. <laughs> Absolutely. I agree. A friend of mine in Montana started carrying. He always he was not you know he was a rifle guy. Always started asking me questions about handguns. I shoot handguns a lot, not especially well, but well enough. Uh, started asking me questions about handguns. I go, what happened? Well, yeah, he was hiking out with a elk quarter on his backpack when a mountain lion decided to add itself to the backpack. Okay. So he said, yeah, and after that he carried a ten millimeter clock. So if I'm out in dangerous game country, I will usually have a 10 millimeter on me. Okay. Once again, that's probably the most I can shoot accurately and deploy quickly. So that will just have to be it. Gotcha. Well, and it goes back to, you know, be aware of your surroundings. So 
the best way to do this is to not hunt alone. I hundred percent. Like, I don't like hunting alone. Every once in a while, I end up doing it. It's worth the risk to me, but it is a risk. And I am less adventurous in terms of what terrain I'm willing to brave and things like that. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Call. And th and that's how you counter that is just yeah. not get into brush where you can't defend yourself. Well, it's not even that. My biggest problem is not so much defending myself. In practical terms, most wild animals don't want to have anything to do with your chances of attack while real are comparatively slim until you twist an ankle somewhere. Right. And if you twist an ankle somewhere and trying to figure out how to get out of something and night comes and if you are a crippled target animals so figure that out surprisingly well yeah it's kind of in their dna yeah <laughs> now red dot sites you had said your your point of diminishing returns is about three hundred dollars uh three four hundred somewhere in there yeah depending on the red dot site right so um Red dot sites, optical and mechanical, are very, very simple devices. Um, the fact that Trigger can charge just six, seven hundred, whatever it charges for an RMR, a little good for them. I, I wouldn't have the balls. Um, the current trend is stored in closed red dot sites. Mm -hmm. You know, the stuff, small tubular ones like the uh, Aimpoint Acro, also very expensive, very nice red dot site. There's nothing wrong with it, but I, I don't know if I'd pay that much money. But they're coming down in price. I don't think that's changed too much. Yeah, I, th I think the prices are being driven down by like Hollow Sun and Viridian and other well, manufacturers. Well, Hollow Sun is actually going up. Um, Viridian I haven't looked at. I've, I know they make optical stuff. I've never even laid eyes on one. Um, I'm pretty sure it's the same OEM stuff as everybody else's. I don't think they make them themselves. I think they started doing yeah, magnified make optics now as well. And uh, they seem to bought a few influencers. All of a sudden, I see people in forums yelling how wonderful a particular scope is. And I looked at the picture and some of the specs. It's the same exact thing that they're saying is better than something else, just different labeling. Um, but Viridian is not a big name in optics. Not yet. I mean, they they came up with the la on the laser side. Otherwise, they're not really very noticeable. They're just kind of popping up. Um, and but and I, I... Mm -hmm. go, ahead. go ahead. No, go ahead. Companies like Primary Arms, Swamp Fox, Vortex, Shield, which is made in UK, which is helpful. Uh, Shield is, you know, they have an enclosed site coming out. It's going to be a little expensive, but they are RMS, tiny, open, uh, pistol style red dot sites, and the three to four hundred dollar range. They do really well. Uh, Primary Arms would be the company I really look at. Um, they have made very few missteps in the last few years, and they are a big threat to the more established manufacturers. Okay. Well, that's good to know. All right. The last thing I've got for you, Ilya, is brand new guy reaches out to you and says, hey, I don't know what type of scope I need to get. Is there a resource or do you even have a video that walks you through all the different um, parts of it? Not parts of the scope, but specs of a scope so that a novice can go okay after watching this i know and real and determining what it is i'm using it for i now know what it is to go and look for uh i haven't done a single video on that but uh, once a year I update my recommendations and i've done a couple of videos on specific recommendations where i go over that to some degree uh, some okay. years ago, I wrote a series of articles called Fundamentals of Rifle Scopes, and it still sits on my legacy website. Uh, I need to update the pictures and all that. Legacy website is called, something called Optics Thoughts, and there's uh, articles that they're called Fundamentals of Rifle Scopes. It ain't short. It's about 30,000 words. Um, I need to update it. should probably do a single integrated video on I know nothing. What does all this stuff mean? Right. I, I've done all of it in a variety of separate videos. I don't think I've ever done one. And what was that um, legacy site again? Optics Thoughts. When I first started having my own uh, website, I, I made a website called Optics Thoughts, and I still keep it up. And my recommendations with the links and everything actually on there, uh, spaced out by price and application. So if, uh, for example, I have a field uh, under $600, 
for precision, these are my recommendations. For LPGO, these are my recommendations. The market is huge. There is no no longer way for me to try everything, but I oh, yeah. try a lot of stuff. So I make it a point to maintain once a year. I I update it. I make it a point to maintain a list of recommendations of things I recommend. It doesn't mean it's all the good scopes out there. Obviously, there's plenty of good stuff, but I try to explain what I like and why I like it. Uh, awesome. Okay, I'm gonna put. So when I end up posting this, I'm going to put some links to you, including your, your legacy site, your website now, and your YouTube page. Yeah, I have so a that, bunch of different things online, and I intentionally maintain it that way. Um, simply because I'm always concerned, all the social media platforms, various platforms, if I don't, since I don't own the servers, somebody can always kick me out. Correct. And uh, so I have multiple resources here and there. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's um, that's. Do I have a message? Do we have a messaging thing here? I can send a message. There you go. Chat. Uh, how interesting! Does it allow me to post anything, David? Oh, there we go. So here's rifle scope recommendations direct link. Okay. Yeah. that was updated Excellent. beginning of this year okay i am going to let me slide that over there boom now i've got it now i can make a link directly to it for example so what i do my current website at darklordofoptics.com it's hosted by locals and locals does a good job uh, i'm not a website designer i don't feel like learning how to do it I can do monetization there. I can keep political things behind a paywall and they make it all uh, simple. But it's more of a blogging video podcast type format. For things like recommendations that you want up, you need to put a hierarchical structure and this format doesn't allow it for me. So mm. on a different website, this is just a drop down menu. You can navigate all of this. Okay. Well, Ilya, that's all that I had. Um, was there anything that we touched on you feel we didn't? cover properly or or do you think we cover everything no, there's always well? more to talk about but i think this was fairly extensive I once agree. it goes live if you get questions we can always do this again okay you can we can always disagree on something again oh yeah and uh, and uh i'm gonna <laughs> i do a live show on youtube every couple of weeks so i'm gonna drag you into one of those at some point okay i like it but those i do live because i like the live q a mm. i usually have some sort of preset discussion for about half hour or so now I'll open it up to a q a and whatever comes up in the chat box becomes the next discussion i actually went back and watched the one you did episode 55 live mm -hmm. which is where you talked about wagner first and then oh yeah the ukraine one, yeah. With, yeah. With my cousin eugene is my cousin oh so he's, okay yeah so he served in the marine corps he came here i came here when i was 15. he came here when he was i think 17. something like that oh. uh, but then once he was in college he decided to go uh, to become a, a wicked warrior uh, he had something to prove uh, <laughs> and then uh, george bush decided that we need to go on a vacation in iraq and they pulled him out of grad school at stanford uh, to go overthrow saddam hussein oh wow he has a phd in uh, um, cryptography and bio-related uh, computer science so interesting combination he's an interesting smart guy but he feels very strongly about ukraine i don't have any ill will or goodwill uh, toward ukraine i grew up in russia so i intensely despise russia but um if russians and ukrainians could be just occupied by killing each other and it didn't touch anybody else i'd be perfectly fine <laughs> okay all right okay, least, and, and, and that's what i like uh, i like you yeah i love your honesty so I like it. All right. All right. Well, Ilya, thank you for coming on. And we definitely need to do this again, but we'll give it some time. Absolutely. All right. Let me know if you need anything else from me, and uh, I'll uh, look out for the episode. Awesome. Thank you. All right. You have a good day. You too. Until next time. Don't be a little bitch. Yeah. <laughs>